But now we're Batman Beyond. Honestly, a show I didn't really watch much when I was growing up, as I was fixated on Batman the Animated Series, Superman the Animated Series, and the two Justice League shows. Batman Beyond is one of those shows I picked up when I was a little bit older, around the age of 12. So throughout the past two videos, I'll be going through every episode as I talk about them and then rank them all in each season, and then put them together in my final ranking of each episode in the series. What a fitting time to talk about the show since it started 25 years ago in 1999. Just before we get into the episodes, please consider subscribing. It's free and it really helps me out a lot. Also, please consider joining my Patreon or my channel memberships. It's only a dollar a month to get early access to new videos and it does really help me out a lot. Anyways, we're starting off with... First episode of Batman Beyond and it's a two-parter. I am so keen. So we start with some men waiting at an airbase as they have a woman tied up, as we hear on the TV that they're watching that they want a $5 million ransom. Batman being Bruce manages to work his way through the henchmen dressed up in the Batman Beyond suit. One of the henchmen's gonna shoot the hostage, but Batman comes in to stop them. He fights most of them off until he suffers a heart attack where he pulls a gun on this henchman after he hits him a few times. The police arrive as he panics about how he pulled a gun on someone. After that, he gives up being Batman as we see him put the suit back and turn all the lights off in the Batcave. What an awesome intro as we now get the intro to the show, and this kicks ass. It really sets you up for what kind of show to expect. So we skip 20 years after the events that took place just before, where we see Terry on a train as one bloke dressed up as a jester sprays a TV screen. After hitting on a woman, Terry confronts him as the jester manages to get away as the door opens. Then we see some man named Harry as he gives a CD to this guy named Warren, as Harry has some kind of infection and falls to the ground as these men take him away. Mr. Powers, or as I will call him by his first name, Derek, ends up confronting Warren about what he saw, where he asks about the CD as he notices that they had a missing file. When Warren's looking at the CD, we find out that Warren is Terry's dad, as Terry ends up leaving after you told him that he's grounded. Terry then goes to the nightclub to see his partner Dana, as the Jokers come in and cause a ruckus. Terry deals with a few of them, as he manages to get a motorbike as the Jokers chase after him, as he manages to lead them to Wayne Mansion. Bruce comes out, and even as an old man, he kicks the Jokers' asses with Terry's help. They flee, as Bruce seems to be struggling for breath, Terry ends up helping him to get inside his house and get his medicine. He gives Bruce the medicine as he ends up falling asleep. Terry then notices a bat in the grandfather clock. He tries to let it out, but notices that it's a secret door where he finds a bat cave. When in there, Bruce whacks him and tells him to get out. Terry gets home to find the police outside his place, where his mother is about to tell him what happened, but he rushes through to see for himself that his dad died. After the funeral, Terry ends up looking through his dad's belongings as he finds a CD that his father had. He then decides to see Bruce as he tells him that something's off with his company, as Derek has something to do with it since he owns the company now. Bruce then opens the gates to Wayne Manor as Terry walks in, and that's how the episode ends. This episode did a fantastic job with getting me interested. I like how this has already set up the world of Batman Beyond in one episode by establishing that Bruce has been retired for 20 years, and for good reason, and that now Terry's on the path to become the new Batman. It also establishes the world of the new Gotham really well, as we see gangs walking around freely without much interference from the police, as many of the Jokers seem to own the streets now. I'm also interested in the mystery of what Terry's father found out, and what's really going on with Derek, as it seems to be a very serious thing that could affect everyone. What a great start. I'm ready to see how this two-parter ends. Here we go, the second part. So we pick up basically right where we left off as Terry's in the Batcave as Bruce explains what the CD is all about as Derek's using Bruce's company to make nerve gas. Terry tells Bruce that he needs to suit up and stop Derek, but Bruce tells Terry that he was Batman. Terry questions why he isn't Batman anymore as he knows that something happened to make him not be Batman anymore, but he leaves to go take the CD to Barbara. As he's doing so, Derek ends up trying to get Terry into the car with him as he demands to get the disc. Terry throws it as he then makes a run for it. He gets away as Derek finds the disc, and now Terry doesn't have evidence, so he ends up sneaking into the Batcave to steal a bat suit as Bruce is fucking pissed. So with the bat suit, Terry ends up listening into Derek as he's showing off the nerve gas that he's working on, as he wants to sell off the nerve gas to people that will pay enough for it. Derek's guards catch up to Terry as he's listening in, as he manages to get away, and Bruce then tells Terry that he needs to bring the suit back, and that he has no right taking it. Terry says no as he's in the middle of dealing with guards, as Bruce activates a failsafe where it completely paralyzes the suit. So Terry gets his ass kicked, and as they're about to shoot him, Bruce turns the suit back on. Bruce directs Terry to a hidden door on the wall, as he's going to try and get Terry to return the suit, but Terry ends up convincing Bruce to let him deal with Derek, as it's his only chance to deal with his father's killer. Terry goes to stop them as he ends up using the nerve gas against Derek, as he goes to stop the carriage with the nerve gas on it, as Derek's assistant is driving away. He catches up to fight with the assistant as he manages to make the ship fall into the water. We then see Bruce going to see Terry at his place, as he offers Terry a job as a part-time assistant, obviously being a hint to him becoming the new Batman. The episode ends with Derek as he isn't going to die from the virus, but now he's extremely radioactive. This episode's good too. Not as good as the first part, but I will say the ending which leads up to the future of the show is really interesting. 
I'm definitely interested to see where things go, as now Terry has his first official villain with Derek being transformed into the villain named Blight, and the design's really cool. It's going to be interesting to see where the rest of this show goes since it's only the second episode in, just below the first part. Blackout starts with a truck going into a building as they see some kind of goop thing moving around the facility. They end up messing with the electronics and makes one of the buildings blow up, as it manages to escape as one of the men has to drive an important truck out of the facility to avoid it potentially blowing up, as they were on it. We then go to Bruce as he confronts Derek, as he doesn't want Derek to touch Fox Tech, and he doesn't want to find out that he was a part of the attacks. Derek's surprised to find out that Terry works for Bruce now, since last time he tried to get Terry for the CD, as both Bruce and Terry leave. As Bruce and Terry leave, we see the group thing as we find out that their name is Ink, as they talk to Derek about how Bruce knows too much. Derek gives her a new job as we then see Terry with Dana at a sports game. At the game, Bruce ends up calling Terry, so now he has to leave Dana, as we see Ink break into another facility where they destroy more tech. Terry's talking to Bruce as Bruce got a little bit off of Ink, and is looking at it under a microscope as Terry finds the tech that was destroyed. He runs into Ink as they throw him around until they decide to make a run for it. Back at the Batcave, Terry confronts Bruce and Bruce explains who she is and that she's a new hire of Derek's. Terry goes out again to run into Ink as they're destroying things at the docks, so now the problem is finding a way to beat them. Terry finds out that they don't like the water as Ink manages to get away. So the next day, Ink goes to talk to Derek as their skin starts to peel off, and this visual is so fucking cool. But that night, Terry runs into Ink again, as they've destroyed another place as Ink attaches herself to the Batmobile as Terry and Bruce don't realise that she's on it. She fights Terry in the Batcave, and bro, this is so gross. Bruce stops her the water, and is he wearing the Grey Ghost's hat and glasses? I think he is. So Terry throws up what went in him as they continue to fight since Ink destroyed the waterline. She ends up trying to leave but can't find a way out, so she decides to smash all the displays as Terry gets Mr. Freeze's gun and freezes into a million pieces. The episode ends at GCPD as Bruce rings Barbara as Terry drops off Ink to them. This is still a good episode. I will say it isn't as good as the other two, but damn, it's still good. Ink's a cool character as a design, but unfortunately just not that interesting as a character, and I think that's one thing that could have been better. She could have had a bit more personality or even a good backstory, but hopefully we'll get that in the future. I really don't like that one shot where Ink forces herself inside a Terry. That shit makes me want to throw up. But the episode's at the bottom of the list. We start this episode off with a guy named Willie at Hamilton High School, as he seems to be interested in this woman named Blade. He runs up to her as he's obviously interested in her, as this guy named Nelson rocks up and flirts with her. She leaves after Nelson offers to take her on a date, as Willie gets knocked into Nelson's car, but as Nelson's about to punch him for almost scratching his car, Terry tells him to stop. Nelson ends up stopping as we then go to a construction site where Willie's father's running it. He tells Willie to stand up for himself and that he needs to fight back and hit him where it hurts. That night, Terry sees police cars and we then hear the police talking about a two-story toll golem, which was actually a lifting machine that we saw earlier at the construction site. Terry hears it all as we then see the next day that Willie uses a golem to get back at Nelson as Terry comes in and stops the device. Terry does so by making Willie punch into an electrical line, where it turns off after being electrocuted. So after that, Terry goes back to the Batcave to talk to Bruce about the Golem. They try to find out who would have done this, as lots of people don't like Nelson. Back at the high school, Blade ends up asking Willie out to the dance on Saturday, as she's pissed off for Nelson. Nelson comes in and starts to hit Willie as he ends up stopping after a teacher walks by. Willie then finds out that he has some kind of electrical powers, as that night he finds out that he can control it after taking out the Jokers as they try to jump him. We then go to Saturday night where we see Terry with Dana, as Blade is with Willie, as Nelson ends up getting with Blade. Nelson takes Willie outside as he tells Willie to get out of his way where he pushes him into the water below. Willie goes back to the dance where everyone laughs at him besides Terry and Dana. She tries to help him as Terry suits up since Bruce told him that the golem's on his way. But we then see this full on anime shit where Willie radiates as the golem comes out from the ground and it's honestly awesome. Batman tries to confront Willie and even his father as he attacks them both. Batman ends up saving his father as he takes him to safety, as he fights the golem and ends up completely destroying it as Willie cries. We then see Willie and Juvie as we see him block the TV, and that's how the episode ends. God damn, another good episode. We're already hitting 4 for 4 with these episodes, and that's insane. I actually really like Willie as a character, as he definitely has a lot of motivation to do what he does, as he feels like a loser, but when he has the chance to stand up for himself by stealing a golem and using it, he takes it. But then for him to actually be able to control electronic devices is really neat. Kind of like Livewire, but is actually an interesting, non-annoying character with some honestly really fucking awesome shots with some awesome animation. Those shots of Willy controlling Golem where he radiates go hard. I actually like this episode quite a lot, so it goes above Rebirth Part 2, but below Part 1. No way we're already at this episode. This is an all-time favourite of mine. We start Meltdown at the docks as Batman's investigating something. 
He finds a few people waiting for a boat to arrive where they send over some kinds of barrels to the boat. Batman comes in to stop them and manages to do so, even when one of them tries to drive away. Batman finds out that it's Derek behind it after one of the goons had his number on his phone where they talk on the phone. Derek hangs up where his skin starts to peel off at his eyes as he puts sunglasses on and tells the rest of the people with him to finish as he obviously needs to fix himself. Derek goes to his men where he tells him that his radiation is getting stronger, so it's making his skin peel off even faster as a woman named Stephanie Lake tells him that he could get a new body. The only thing though is that she wants to test it with someone that has damaged DNA like Derek, so right after that we see motherfucking Mr. Freeze. Stephanie ends up using Mr. Freeze as a test to see if they can put someone with damaged DNA into a new body, as it actually managed to work. We go to Dana and Terry as Bruce approaches Terry, where he shows him the news report that shows Derek showing off his experiment with Victor. Bruce wants Terry to follow him as he obviously doesn't trust Victor considering that he was Mr. Freeze for so long, but as Batman follows him around he seems to be living a normal life as he even goes to see his own grave. But as he visits his grave, a man tries to shoot him and Stephanie as Batman stops him. Batman gets him tied up where the man asks why he's protecting Victor since he lost everything because of him. But Victor lets him out as he promises that he's going to try and make it up to everyone that he hurt in the past. We then see that after an interview on TV that Victor's sweating bullets until it starts to snow. He then goes back to the lab with Stephanie to fix his problem, where Derek tells her to turn up the heat. She does as Victor's struggling to breathe, but he manages to break the glass keeping him in there as he runs out to the snow as Batman's trying to find out where Victor went. We then see Mr. Freeze as he goes after Stephanie and Derek, and this costume goes so fucking hard. They make a run for it as he ends up freezing Derek and Stephanie. So after that he goes outside to freeze a bunch of officers. Derek breaks out because of his radiation as Batman tries to tell Mr. Freeze to stop but he doesn't want to as he wants to take everyone down with him. Derek attacks Mr. Freeze and as he almost kills him Batman attacks but Derek introduces himself as Blight since he looks completely different now. They fight for a while until Mr. Freeze manages to shoot Blight away. So Batman tries to get Mr. Freeze out as the whole place is going to collapse in on them. Victor says that he won't go and that Batman's the only one that cares about him as he freezes a wall in front of Batman and goes down with the building as Batman escapes. Derek ends up getting picked up by his men as Bruce talks to Terry about how he could have taken down the whole compound and killed hundreds, but he didn't. And that's how the episode ends. This episode fucking rocks. Let me just get this out of the way, but Mr. Freeze is so fucking good in this episode. I really like the idea of giving him a potential second chance with a new body, but then for it to fail on him when he goes back to his old ways is quite sad. It's great seeing him actually trying to live a new life and move on from his past, but the whole story of this episode is really damn good. I swear that there's never a bad Mr. Freeze episode in this universe since he's such a well-written character in this show as well as B-Taz. Also, to see Mr. Freeze actually kill Stephanie with his freeze gun was a very big surprise. You know what? This goes right at the top. This starts at M Technologies as men steal a chip that's worth a lot as Batman comes in to stop them. Batman gets knocked down as some ghost lady freezes one of the men and some monster throws a rubble at the two other men as a plastic man copy saves him from falling. We find out that the three of them are a superhero team, as Batman sees them from afar and finds out that they are Magma, Freon, and the 2D Man. They turned into the heroes after being exposed to too much radiation, where they transformed into basically being a ripoff of the Fantastic Four, but a team of three. There are a new trio of superheroes based in Gotham, as we then see Barbara talking to a man as he has two people hostage. The trio of superheroes end up breaking in to take out the men that are holding the people hostage, as they manage to save the hostages. So we get back to their hideout where Magma's angry over how the little girl looked at him since she was scared shitless of him, as they all seem to see their powers as a curse. But this other man with them named Howard talks to a general, as they seem to have plans to control the three of them for their own benefit. The next day we see Howard as another man gives them the trio's DNA scans, where they seem to be strange but Howard wants them to run them again. Howard lets the general know that he has a problem as the man that gave him the DNA mysteriously gets knocked out by a chair being thrown at him. Batman ends up detecting some kind of fire as he rocks up to the place to see melted walls as he sees Magma taking the DNA sample. Batman tries to stop him but Magma ends up getting to a ship where he attaches himself to it and ends up the trio's headquarters. At the HQ, they found out that Howard lied to them as they end up being under attack by the general. Batman has to try and get out as he ends up almost being completely squashed by some rubble as he ends up getting out of the rubble and sees that the trio managed to escape. They end up going to confront Howard as they do the same experiment that caused them to end up the way they were as they find out that Howard intentionally wasn't there when it happened. As they find it out and start the experiment, Batman comes in to stop them. He ends up sucking 2D and Freon through the vents as Magma tries to stop Batman from turning the machine off, but Batman stops him by using water against him. Batman manages to abort the experiment as he asks if Howard is satisfied. I actually like this episode, but I feel like it'd be much better as a two-parter. I just feel like the trio aren't fleshed out enough as characters, and probably need a bit more time to develop where the twist would be a slow burn, but the episode's still good. The twist is very interesting where Howard set them up to make him end up the way they are, as even Freon wasn't even meant to be transformed either, but she did. 
The episode just needed more time to develop everything and make the viewer care about the trio, which is extremely hard to do in a single episode, and this episode does it well considering how little time they have. It goes above Blackout but below Rebirth Part 2. Alright, so this episode starts with Derek as some man named Shreve is messing with Derek's senses. Shreve puts on a suit as it manages to destroy a wall, as Derek doesn't seem interested in his suit that he's created. We then see Bruce as he says that he's ashamed about how the company's being run at the moment, and that it seems to have forgotten its history. Bruce proposes a vote about a potential leadership change, as most people vote for the vote to happen, as Derek reluctantly agrees. After that, Bruce tells Terry that it went the way he wanted it to, as Bruce takes Terry to the theater where his parents died as Ace is barking. Terry goes to sort out Ace as Bruce then walks into an old abandoned GCPD building. As he does, the building starts to shake as Terry suits up and helps to get him out, as Shriek shows up to deal with him. He knocks out Bruce as Batman manages to save Bruce as Shriek leaves. Terry takes Bruce to hospital as Bruce is pissed that he has to stay overnight, but Terry tells Bruce just to calm down and take the night off, as he has a piece of Shriek that might take him right to him. That night though, as Bruce is in hospital, someone's speaking to him which seems to be through his mind, as no one's actually with him. Terry at the back cave finds out that the piece he stole amplifies sound vibrations, but as he finds that out, Bruce gets led out to the window where he gets told to open it. He ends up doing so as he gets hinted towards jumping out of the window, as he screams and hospital guards even end up holding Bruce down where he gets put to sleep. Terry disguises himself as a pizza delivery boy to see Shreve, as he finds out more about sound waves where Shreve gets suspicious about him and tries to knock Terry out. Terry ends up kicking Shreve over and escaping as the police direct Shreve, but Terry goes to the hospital to try and see Bruce. Derek's there telling him that Bruce will be in his hands as Bruce is currently in the psych ward. Derek leaves after Terry tries to throw hands with him as he talks to Shreve and gives him the new name Shriek. Terry suits up to help Bruce, where he explains that Shreve made audio transmitters to mess with Bruce as he implanted one of them into his bandage on his head. Batman then goes to find Shriek as they end up fighting in a factory. I find it really cool where Shriek messes with the sound here as he blocks out most frequencies with the device he established earlier to Terry when he disguised himself. But Batman ends up breaking the device in his hand as now Shreve can't hear anything at all as Batman tells him to get up. So we go to the vote where it doesn't work in Bruce's favour, but Bruce knew that the voice wasn't him as he kept calling him Bruce, and I love that. Such a cool little detail where Bruce calls himself Batman in his mind, so when the voice was calling him Bruce, he knew it wasn't him. But Terry says that it's his name now, and that's how the episode ends. I'm so surprised that we haven't had a mediocre or a bad episode yet. Every episode has either been good or really good. The whole idea that everyone thinks that Bruce is losing his mind after running into Shreve is actually a really interesting idea. Also, Shreve becoming Shriek where the villain mainly uses sound waves is definitely an interesting idea for a villain, and I think that the episode uses it really well, especially with the main fight where he uses the device to basically eliminate most sounds. It's such a unique idea, but I really think it works well. The episode goes above Heroes, but below Rebirth Part 2. Dead Man's hand starts with the boat out in the ocean as a bigger boat almost sinks him. On the big boat we see some rich pretentious people as some other people with symbols like aces on them writing playing cards get onto the boat. When they do they end up throwing some people off the boat as they end up stealing their valuables off them. Batman from afar sees this going on as he ends up trying to stop them but they manage to get away after they start to blow up the boat as Batman has to save the people on board. Batman saves them as he then has to go and rush off to see Dana at a nightclub as she's pissed off that he doesn't spend time with her. Terry tries to tell her that things have been getting in the way but she doesn't believe him as Terry ends up walking outside. When he does, he sees a woman as she asks him if it was a big fight. They end up talking as Terry tells her that he has some after school job that makes up most of his time and that his boss won't give him time off. She inquires about what he does as a job but Terry tells her that he runs errands. As he asks what she does as he finds out that she's new to Gotham. Apparently your parents move around a lot because of work and she never has any actual friends because when she makes new friends she ends up moving down. But she ends up introducing herself as Melanie Walker. She tries to kiss him but he pushes her off as Terry thinks that things are going too quick. He tells her that they probably can later, as Melanie tells Terry to meet him where they are at midnight tomorrow night. Terry goes back to the Batcave as Bruce asks if he saw Dana again. Terry tells him that it's over because of him, but Bruce already knows what's up. He knows that they'll both get back together soon, as they now have to figure out where this gang is, as they're known as the Royal Flush Gang. They're a full family that robs people, as apparently Batman had split them apart in the past, and now they want revenge. As they're talking, Melanie walks in as she's apparently number 10 in the Royal Flush Gang. Ah, uh, I get it. Anyways, they end up robbing the place after deactivating the alarms, but guards end up surrounding them as they're going to steal a priceless sword. They fight the guards and Batman ends up approaching them, as the gang ends up taking the guard as a hostage as Batman has number 10. They end up telling Batman to leave 10 and let them leave or they'll kill the guard. He lets 10 go and ends up letting them leave for a moment to go and chase them. The gang end up dropping the guard as Batman saves him. He takes him to the hospital as he sees that the time's half past 12. Terry rushes to where he met Melanie last night, as he realizes that he's too late as Melanie ends up running out to him as they kiss in the rain. 
Later that night, as the two are walking, Melanie tells Terry that her family are probably going to move again soon, as they end up agreeing to see each other again at the same time the next night. Terry ends up going to the Batcave again to see Bruce, as Terry says that he's got better places to be, since they don't know that the Royal Flush gang are going to attack again tonight. Terry says that one night won't make a difference, but Bruce says it will, as Terry says that he doesn't want to end up being like Bruce, being old and alone. We then see Melanie as she's arguing with her father, she ends up walking away where her mother tries to convince her to stay. She ends up doing so as Melanie rings Terry to tell him that they can't see each other again, as she comes up with an excuse to not see him again, even though she wants to. Terry looks into it by using a computer to find out her house floor plans, where he ends up suiting up to go to her place. He finds out that she's a part of the Royal Flush Gang as they get home, and try to hunt him down as they know that he's here. Batman manages to knock two of them out as he then goes to fight Ace. He ends up sending him down the laundry chute, and this guy's definitely dead. There is absolutely no arguing that. But Batman runs into town as her father throws a death card at Batman. The car blows up as her father chases him where they end up fighting. Ten catches up as Batman tells her to go, but her card gets shot where she falls as Batman saves her. They all get handed into the police as Terry sees Melanie and her family being taken in as Bruce approaches him. Terry apologizes about the things he said to Bruce and he asks if he had the same kind of thing happening to him. The episode ends as Bruce tells Terry about a woman named Selena Kyle, and this is obviously yet another good episode. I really like seeing how Terry ends up falling for another woman where it ends up not working out, because it really makes for an emotional story. I feel like we got to know more about Melanie in this one episode compared to what we already know about Dana. Dana ends up becoming more of a character later on, but to see Terry being so happy and excited to see someone just makes it hurt more when they turn out to be a bad guy. The Royal Flush gang themselves aren't interesting though, besides from the gimmick of them being dressed up as the cards that are a part of the Royal Flush. Those cards being 10, Jack, Queen, King and Ace, but in the same suit. A little bit of poker tips for you all, even though most of you probably can't legally gamble. But this episode isn't the best, but it isn't the worst either. Goes above Golem, but below Rebirth Part 1. Alright, so we start with the Jokers as a man in an ice cream truck shows him the weapons he has in a truck, as Batman comes in to stop them. He does so after one of the Jokers accidentally destroys the truck, as the police arrive. After that we see Terry asleep in class as Dana asks him to go to a sports game, and it's that sport that we saw in one of the early episodes. Terry almost falls asleep as they see one of the players puts a patch on them, or as they're known slappers, that seem to make them much stronger as they bump an opposing player through the wall. Terry's suspicious, so after he drops Dana home, he suits up to stop the robbers that are robbing some kind of tech store. The robbers make a run for it as Batman shows up where one of the robbers named Mason slaps on a few slappers as he fights Batman. Mason throws Batman under a bunch of TVs as they leave. The next day at school, Mason looks run down as he runs into two other classmates where they then give him some kind of card. Mason then goes to a car where he gives him the card to get more slappers as he uses them to make himself feel better, as Terry sees this from afar. That night, Batman sneaks into his locker to find slappers as the coach comes in to fight Batman in one of the sports suits. They end up fighting in the arena as he knocks out the coach. Terry ends up going home where his mother seems to be suspicious about him as she got a call about how he fell asleep in class. Matt tries to grab Terry's bag to pull out the demerit cards, which are basically for slacking off in class, as the slappers fall out of his bag that he was using as evidence. Terry's mother now thinks that Terry's using them as she grounds him, but still lets him see Bruce as we then go to the Batcave as Terry managed to keep one of them. They look at it under a microscope where they find out that Venom's in the slapper, so now Terry has to go and visit motherfucking Bane. He goes to where Bane is as Batman manages to sneak past the guards into the building, where he ends up seeing Bane. We see that he's old and in a wheelchair and looking almost dead, as this was the effects that Venom had on his body, as his carer tells us about his deteriorating health. So with that being a dead lead, now they have to find out who's making the Venom, as we then see Mason having it rough at training. He ends up getting another car where he's about to get a slapper, as Batman comes in to try and find out who's this person that's dealing with slappers. Batman ends up tracking their car to an abandoned newspaper factory, as we then see that it was Bane's carer that was dealing out the slappers. Batman takes most of them down, but Bane's carer slaps on a few slappers to fight Batman. They fight for quite a while until Batman knocks him into some other slappers where he has too many on. He's in absolute agony until he manages to push through it, and Batman ends up beating him by blinding him as the place ends up exploding. He seems to still be alive as Terry ends up getting home a minute late, as Bruce comes in with him saying that it was his fault. But he gives Terry's mother results to show that Terry is clean, so now Terry's mother believes him. The episode ends with Bruce is having a coffee with Terry and his family, as Terry falls asleep and Bruce leaves him to sleep on the couch, where his mother puts a blanket on him. Okay, so this episode's a bit weaker, but I still like it. I think it was pretty predictable that it wasn't going to be Bane creating the slappers since he's so old, but when you see his carer in that one scene, it became quite obvious that it was going to be him. Besides that, it's a solid metaphor for steroids, but it makes a lot of sense in this universe to use Venom since it seems to make Bane so much stronger, but also affect him much later in life. We even get a drug metaphor by seeing how Terry's mother reacts to Terry having them in his bag. It's cool to see Bane in this show, but besides from that, I do think it's the weakest episode yet. 
still good, but I think it's fair for it to be at the bottom of the list so far. Spellbound starts with this couple as the girl named Chelsea has to leave and go home. As they're walking home, a man in a swirly costume named Spellbinder shows her an eye where she gets transported into a jungle with him. We see that it's just an illusion as Chelsea stumbles through her house and then into a room and has her vision then sees her going through a maze to get a sculpture. Spellbinder then makes her follow him where she makes him throw it into what seems to be lava in her vision, but in reality she threw her $80,000 sculpture into the water. Her father comes in asking her what she's doing. And she gets in trouble for throwing it into the water as Spellbinder ends up taking it. Bro, that shows how rich they are. She doesn't even get in that much trouble for throwing something that expensive into the river. Oh, damn, that must be loaded. But we then see Terry at school as he's talking to a friend and we see Barbara walk past with an officer as they're going to question Chelsea about throwing the sculpture into the water. His friend walks into class as Terry listens into Barbara's conversation with a psychologist as he says that Chelsea usually does these things for attention. Barbara believes that she made the whole thing up and then leaves. We then go to a man named Mr. Deacons as he closes up for the night, where Spellbinder uses him to steal from his shop, as we cut straight back to the aftermath where one of the guards is being questioned by Barbara. Batman's listening in as we see that Mr. Deacons is having visions of a war where he thinks that the dress is a dead person as he tries to leave the shop with a dress. He ends up handing the dress to Spellbinder as he ends up leaving, but Batman has to fight Mr. Deacons, and after Batman kicks Mr. Deacons, he seems to be out of the vision as he doesn't know what's going on. Terry ends up going to a wedding of his friend's parents, as one of the cameras makes her hallucinate, as Spellbinder is using one of the cameras. She sees giant bugs everywhere, as Terry fights Spellbinder after saving the wife. Batman has to save her yet again, where the hallucinations wear off, as Spellbinder gets her jewelry and makes a run for it. Terry hallucinates that he's going to be jumping into a waterfall, and as he does, Bruce makes him snap out of it, where he just survives the fall. Back at the Batcave, Bruce shows him what exactly happened. He explains that Spellbinder has advanced tech that can make anyone see anything and believe that they're actually there. Next day after Terry sees the psychologist, Bruce ends up seeing an intruder, which ends up being Terry where he's in a hallucination that he's in the game show. Bruce ends up making Terry snap out of it as he's actually stealing all of Bruce's belongings, as Bruce ends up finding out that the school psychologist, Dr. Ira Billings, is Spellbinder since all of the three victims are connected to him. Spellbinder is still waiting at the front room where Terry suits up to deal with Spellbinder. He makes a run for it as they then fight in the woods. They fight for a bit until Batman has to chase down Spellbinder. He ends up getting Spellbinder after he made Batman see him near a cliff where Spellbinder approaches from behind. He gets taken into the police as Barbara meets Terry where she knew about her father but tells Terry to stay out of trouble. This is a cool episode. I think it's just a really cool idea to have a villain that messes with your senses by making you see other things. Spellbinder is a cool villain in regards to design and powers, but it being a psychologist that we see twice before the reveal is kind of weak. I don't have much else to say about this episode, but it goes above Blackout but below Heroes. Ink's already getting a second episode. Alright, well we start with her being frozen in an ice block as this guy named Aaron seems to be shitty at his boss for not getting a raise. He's talking to himself as he thinks that Ink is the only one that's listening to him, where he seems to be in love with Ink as he gets called up to his boss's office. His boss ends up firing him after his strange activities with Ink. Aaron comes back later that day and decides to let Ink free by cutting out the power that keeps the ice frozen. Ink makes her escape as we then see Bruce and Terry at the Batcave showing off a Batman exosuit that puts too much strain on Bruce's heart, and that's why he doesn't use it. An alarm goes off as they find out that Ink has been freed, as Bruce gives Terry the freeze gun as he's suiting up. Batman gets to the scene where people are running away, as one of them has black on them which ends up being Ink, as they end up breaking the ice gun. They fight until eventually Ink escapes through the sewer system, as we then see Aaron as Ink drops in to tell them that she saw and heard everything that he did over the past few months. She plays on the fact that he has a crush on her, as she stays at his place until it goes dark, where she can easily go out and do her thing. Also, this is honestly hilarious. Maybe we'll think of something to keep us busy until then. Hmm. As that's going on, Terry's sealing up all the cracks as he's worried that she's going to come back to the Batcave, since last time they fought her, she snuck her way into the Batwing and into the Batcave. Bruce shows him that her DNA is damaged to the point where she can't transform into her human self, so that's why she didn't sneak out as a human self, and now she wants to repair her DNA. We then see Ink with Aaron as they're trying to break into full-ton labs, as they steal some kind of chemicals. They get what they need as Aaron says that he wants to be like her, they then hear Batman as he's sneaking by. Ink then manages to get the jump on Batman as they fired it out, until Batman gets the battering Bruce made for him as he knocks her out. As Batman knocks her out, Aaron uses a mechanical arm to fight Batman, and then knock him out as Aaron comes to Ink's aid. Ink comes back together as they take Batman with them. Whilst having Batman tied up, Ink uses some kind of chemical she stole to make herself stronger, when she can transform back to her old self. Ink goes up to Batman where she ends up telling Bruce that they're at Gotham Hills Arena and that he needs to come or she will kill him. As they're waiting for Bruce, Ink gives Aaron his reward which is making him like her. 
Bruce arrives to see that Aaron only got half the treatment where he looks all fucked up, and it's honestly quite disturbing. Batman comes out where it ends up being Ink as she grabs Bruce as he ends up transforming with the exosuit as they fight for a bit. Ink ends up knocking Bruce down as Aaron comes up asking for the rest of the treatment. She tells him to get out of his way and that he's a loser as he attaches himself underwear. They struggle for a bit until Batman manages to get out and break the roof whilst it's raining before Ink kills Bruce. Ink ends up melting away as Terry's glad that Bruce didn't stay retired, but this episode ends with Aaron at his old workplace being kept captive as a woman working there feeds him and tells her about her life. Ink's actually a lot better in this episode compared to her first episode, Blackout. But I really like this episode. Ink's shown to be a big threat as she managed to destroy the freeze gun that made her lose in the previous episode. Also, you've got to feel bad for Aaron. He didn't deserve that fate, even though he decided to be too much of a simp by doing absolutely anything she wanted him to do. I actually hope that he gets a second dose of the chemicals that made Ink turn into what she is, but I don't think it's going to happen. I think it would be cool to see him completely transform and then decide to get revenge on Ink by trying to transform them both into one person, but we just got to see what happens later on. Goes above Shriek but below Rebirth Part 2. This episode starts with Barbara as she's talking to her husband, the Steve Harvey lookalike named Sam, as they end up hearing something. The woman named Kurare comes out to attack them as Barbara tries to defend her husband. Batman sees this going on and attacks Kurare. Batman calls for officers as they end up making a run for it and end up getting away as officers arrive. They both get shot at as Kurare ends up dealing with the officers and then gets away. Back at the Batcave, Bruce knows who this is as she's a part of the Society of Assassins. Not the League apparently, but no one knows of her name or her face. Terry asks if they need to protect Barbara, but as Bruce says they don't need to protect her, Barbara comes out to say that her husband is. So now Barbara knows who Batman is. Damn, this is cold as fuck. Bruce and Barbara haven't talked in a while as Terry realizes that Barbara was Batgirl, as he tells Terry to stay out of their business. Barbara says that she doesn't want to come back here to tell them again, as Bruce tells her that he has more information about this Kurare character. Bruce gives Barbara the CD as she then leaves. We then see Kurare talking to someone as they seem to be disappointed that they failed them. We then go to the next night where Barbara has offices all around her house as they're leaving and Kurare and Batman are watching from afar. Kurare ends up taking out some offices as she makes her way towards the building. She gets in as Batman ends up approaching her and fighting her. Batman ends up seeing her face for a moment and she ends up getting to what seems to be Sam as she throws a sword at him. It ends up being a dummy as Batman approaches it where a trap goes off as Batman's stuck in it. Kurare ends up escaping as Barbara and a few officers approach Kurare. Barbara ends up seeing that Batman escaped her trap after seeing his batarang suck onto the alarm that controls the trap. Barbara ends up talking to Terry where she gives him one last warning as it'll take him and Bruce to jail if they interfere again. Terry asks why Barbara hates Bruce as she ends up telling him over coffee. She tells Terry how she dated Dick back in the day. Oh god, they're really trying to insist that Bruce and Barbara were a thing in this universe because she implied that after Dick went to Bloodhaven that they became a thing. Totally not fucked up at all. So Barbara ends up saying that she ended up quitting and that Bruce can't, so she hates what he's become. She ends up leaving as we see her talking to men at her office as Karaya overhears her plans. We go back to the Batcave where Bruce says that Sam will probably go on some certain transport line as Terry tells Bruce that he doesn't want to get in Barbara's way again because he actually respects her. Bruce ends up telling Terry what happens to Society of Assassins members when they fail. When they do, the other members hunt them down, but it has never happened before. Basically guaranteeing that Karaya will get Sam as she's apparently the best. We see Sam on a train with Barbara as Kurare gets on the train. She takes out the officers on top and ends up making Barbara's part of the train derail. It crashes into a building as Kurare tries to find them inside the building. Barbara and Sam lock themselves in the meat room as Kurare gets in there and almost kills them, but luckily Batman comes in to stop her. They have a fight as everything in the room turns on as Batman manages to make quick work of it. She then gets handed into the police. The episode then ends as Kurare escapes police custody, where the other members are hunting her down. I'm really mixed about this episode, but I still think it's good. You have one hand where Karare isn't an interesting character, I just think that she's a discount version of Talia or Raish, and on the other hand you have the good which is all the development between Barbara and Bruce and Terry. Their relationship stuff where it really develops in this episode is the best part about it. Besides that the villain just isn't interesting in the slightest. I'll tell you what I would have liked, a twist at the end of the episode where we find out who Karare is. That would have been cool, and that's honestly what I was expecting. It's a bit disappointing that there was no reveal as to who Karare is, maybe we'll see that later on. Goes above heroes but below Shriek. No way we're already at the last episode of this season. Look, I hope it's good because most of these episodes have been pretty good. It starts with the robbery at Plaz Tech, where we see that Blood has his men holding the workers at gunpoint as they're stealing something called Polymold. Batman ends up confronting them, but they end up getting away as the place lights ablaze and Batman has to save the workers inside. One of Blight's men is knocked out as Batman goes up to him and the guy's wallet falls out showing that he works for Wayne Powers. 
which Batman gets the idea that Derek is helping Blight. Speaking of Blight, we see him as he goes to get his skin back as he's pissed off that he couldn't sell the polymold to help him have more materials to get his skin back. We see his son Paxton as he goes to visit his father in his car, where he tells him that he wants him to do something for him. But he then shows his son what's going on with his skin as he can't be seen out in public anymore because it doesn't last long anymore. Terry drops Bruce off where he goes to a press conference with Derek as he announces that he's going to go on temporary leave, where he's letting his son take over the company for now. A protester that was outside Paxton's building gets inside as he says that he's dumping poison into the rivers as he throws a few fish on the table. Derek ends up getting pissed off as everyone sees him transforming into Blight, including Terry as Bruce hit a camera on him. Bruce stops him from harming one of the investors as Batman comes out to fight Blight as he's about to hit Bruce. Blight ends up making a run for it after throwing a table at Batman and now everyone knows that Derek is Blight. Later that day back at Wayne Manor, Bruce puts the pieces together very quickly and how Derek transformed into Blight, explaining that back in Rebirth Part 2 when Terry threw the nerve gas at Derek it transformed him. Terry's glad as now he can't hide from the law, but as that's going on, Blight rings Paxton, as Paxton tells him to get at the ambulance where they might be able to help him. Blight gets pissed off as we then see Batman flying around where he sees the old bat signal lit up. Batman goes there as he sees Paxton where he takes him inside to show him a device that could weaken his radiation. Paxton wants to help take his father in as his radiation has affected his mind as well as him physically and that he needs help. Batman then goes to find Blight, where Paxton says that when things hit the fan they need to be ready to kill Batman as well. Batman ends up seeing a woman go to a ship as Batman sees Blight eating at the side, as the next day, Batman leaves Paxton a CD with Blight's location and a time at 10pm. Batman comes in to confront Blight as he says that Blight killed his father, and I love this line. You killed my father. Do you have the slightest idea how little that narrows it down? So they end up netting Blight as Paxton ends up activating the device where he reveals that he wants to kill his dad to get the whole company. Batman tells Paxton to turn the machine off as it's killing him, where one of his men accidentally shoots the machine as they start shooting Batman. He ends up taking them down as Blight wakes up and starts to make the ship sink, as Blight's after Paxton. Paxton gets away as Blight starts going ape shit in the ship, causing a lot of radiation, as Batman takes the two knock men out as the ship sinks. The episode ends with Batman talking to Paxton as his father probably escaped. This is honestly one of the weaker episodes. I like how Derek just ends up going nuts in this episode and not caring about putting up his Derek persona anymore, but his son's just a boring character. It was extremely predictable that Paxton was going to double cross Batman as soon as he called for his help. I also really like the personal conflict stuff with Terry as he has a personal vendetta against Derek, but even with his personal vendetta, he won't let Paxton kill him. Goes above Shriek but below Disappearing Ink. This season is really good. They really came out swinging with the first season of this show because there's not one episode that isn't below good. Every episode is enjoyable and memorable so far, which is actually insane how good the first season is. The creators behind this show really knew that it had something good going on, didn't they? Well, they definitely did, because even the worst episodes in this season, such as The Winning Edge and Blackout, are still like a 6 out of 10, and Meltdown is an absolute 10 out of 10. I'm honestly just impressed with how well this show has started, but I'm also surprised with how surprisingly dark the first season can be. I wonder if something going on during Season 1 will have an effect on Season 2. Hmm. You know what? Let's just find out and let's get into season two. Starting off with. The first episode of season two starts off with Chelsea showing off her new lizard eyes as she's doing this thing known as splicing. Terry's with Dana and this other woman named Maxine who gets more of a role in this season as they tell Chelsea that it isn't a good idea since she's messing with her DNA. Alright, I'm in this a little bit as I'm editing this video, but I didn't realize until now that Max is voiced by Cree Summer, the voice of Penny from Inspector Gadget. Chelsea ends up giving out cards to the Institute that splices people, as we see lots of adults outside of their facilities protesting as they think it's a crime against nature. The teens that are splicing themselves say it's a way for them to express themselves, as Bruce mentions that something bad will definitely come from this. Terry ends up going to school after being scared by his brother Matt, as we see Barbara's husband Sam, the district attorney, as he says that he's going to outlaw splicing. On the train, two people that have been spliced break the TV as Terry ends up fighting them both. And holy shit, that buffalo looking one is Ice-T. Apparently it is. Also, if you don't know who Ice-T is, he's a popular rapper. And at the moment, he is the lead singer of Body Count. Which is fucking cool. So the two end up leaving after Terry beats them. But Terry ends up at the Chimera Institute with Dana as they're looking at projections of what Dana would look like after being spliced. As they're talking about it, Dr. Abel Curvier comes out to say that Dana would look great with spots. He ends up going to deal with the two that he fought on the train as he says that he needs a doctor. Terry goes to sit up as they see Cuvier give the buffalo a dose of something, as they're going to attack that night. 
As Batman's spying on them, one of them senses him and gets a jump on him. Batman gets knocked out as Cuvier puts him in restraints where he splices him. Batman breaks out where he starts to be affected by the chemicals Cuvier put in him as he tries to splice up Batman. He ends up escaping as Cuvier says that he won't be able to save everyone, as we then see Barbara and Sam as he's working on taking Cuvier down. As Sam's working on it, the three men break in and restrain them as Batman manages to come in to stop them. As Batman's fighting them, he starts transforming as he seems to be much stronger than usual and he can't control it. He goes back to the Batcave as Barbara tries to warn Bruce about what's happened to Terry, where he manages to ask Bruce to help him, where he seems to have transformed into a giant man-bat. He starts to try and jump on Bruce as he gets a tranquilizer gun and knocks Terry out. When knocked out, he ends up curing him. Terry wakes up where Bruce explains that Cuvier infected him with a lot of vampire bat serum, as they see on the news that Cuvier has gone into hiding after the attack. One of Cuvier's claws is still in Terry, as he ends up using Ace to locate where Cuvier is. They find him in an abandoned taxidermy studio, as Batman sneaks in with a dark gun that will kill them all. The Cobra ends up getting a jump on Batman as they knew that he was coming since they could smell him. They fight as Batman kills the three with the gun, whilst Cuvier jabs himself with a bunch of needles. Eventually, Cuvier makes a run for it, but he ends up leading Batman into another room where they fight. Cuvier turned into a giant snake-like creature, which he says is a chimera, but when I looked it up, it looked more like this, not what it looks like in the episode. Anywho, Batman gets tossed around for a bit until eventually makes Cuvier overdose on the chemicals by jabbing more and more into him until he becomes completely deformed. Ace comes in to help Batman as he's about to get eaten, where he knocks Ace out and the place then blows up as Batman and Ace get out in time. The episode ends with Barbara talking to Terry, as she says that he did well but he should ditch the costume as the rewards are small. Terry says that sometimes the small rewards are the best ones. Okay, so this season starts off pretty well. Just a cool idea to have this kind of drug thing where it transforms people into human-animal hybrids. It fits the world of Batman Beyond really well, even though the villain, Cuvier, isn't interesting. Just really a metaphor for other things that you can get to change your looks, but I think it's done well. I will say it's pretty cool to see Terry transform into a giant bat. A solid start so far, we're just going to see where the other episodes take us. Earth Movers starts with Dana with Terry and Jackie at Jackie's place as she's worried that someone's potentially following her. She says it after Terry notices that something isn't right about Jackie, but she explains that she has a feeling that she's being watched and it's happened a few times in the past few days. Her dad comes in saying that they should make more noises that would help him concentrate as we see something outside. Terry ends up seeing it and chasing after it as Terry ends up knocking it over where it crumbles. He goes to Bruce where he thinks it's interesting as the next day at school Terry runs into Dana and Jackie as Terry's worried that they'll come back to see Jackie. Eventually as they're talking to Bill, who actually isn't Jackie's dad, comes to pick her up as she asks if they can take Terry and Dana as well. He says yes, but he has to show all of them something on the way, where he shows them where he wants to build a new factory. As he does, the whole earth starts to shake, as the figure comes out, as Terry suited up as Batman comes in to stop it. He tells them to run as he ends up destroying it, where it's just a mud monster that keeps on forming back, as it seems that the radioactive slime gives him life. Jackie and Bill get into the car as the monster goes for them, but as they drive away, the monster ends up splatting. As Batman's still out, Bruce talks to him, explaining that Bill dumped some kind of toxic waste that can ruin anyone's DNA 10 years ago and that might have something to do with what's going on at the moment. We then see Bill as he's packing all of his stuff, where Jackie wants answers from him but he won't tell him, as he then sees a figure in the hallway. Bill thinks that it's Tony, Jackie's actual father, as he ends up confessing that he didn't know, but it's revealed that it's Batman standing in the hallway. Batman tells him that he better tell her what happened, otherwise he will. Bill then says that he had to expose of excess chemicals and didn't have any money to do it legally. He goes to an abandoned mine shaft to dispose of the chemicals, as Tony isn't sure about it. Bill ends up convincing him as he says that the company will be big and that he'll let Tony be a part of his company. Tony goes down there to help dispose of the chemicals by guiding the canisters down, or they end up knocking some rubble down onto Tony, trapping him. The canister that's still on the rope ends up falling down where it completely covers him, as he thought that Tony died, but now he seems to have come back. Bill knows that Tony's after him, so he makes a run for it as he gets sucked into the ground, as Batman has to save Jackie from suffering the same fate, as Tony's taken the whole house down. He doesn't save her as she's now stuck underground, but she's actually saved from the house. She goes for a walk around as we see Batman in a submarine where he goes to try and save them. Tony tries to stop him as he's making his way to the house, but we then see that Jackie found Tony's corpse and damn, this is fucking dark. Jackie talks to Tony as he says that it wasn't an accident where he pulls Bill out to confront him. Tony tries to kill him as Jackie tries to save Bill, but Batman catches up as he has to fight a few mud monsters. Tony gets pissed as he drags Jackie back to be his hostage as Batman has to fight a giant mud monster now. Whilst fighting the monster, Batman destroys the canisters so Tony doesn't have any power. Eventually they escape as they leave Tony there stuck to the wall, as he ends up dying again, and that's how the episode ends. Fuck, this episode ended up being a lot darker than I thought it would be, but I actually really like it. This whole episode's basically just a vengeful spirit that wants to get his revenge against Bill, by killing him and destroying everything that he has for what he made him do. I really like that kind of stuff as it makes up for some great storytelling, and holy hell, I was surprised to see an actual corpse in the show, and it's as disturbing as you'll think it'd be. 
Really some neat stuff, and I like how they basically show you how Tony died without actually showing the gory stuff. It's good how they left it up to your imagination on how bad his death actually was. At the start of this episode, it was reminding me of the BTAS episode, See No Evil, tonally, where it's a girl's father seeming to follow them. But with this episode, the ending's even stronger. I think this episode's really good, so it definitely goes at the top for this season. We start with a few of the Jokers on bikes as they see some shit fly by them, so they decide to follow. We see on the ship that they're having some serious issue where they have to land instantly and run for their lives as the Jokers have a new recruit and go look at the ship. They think that it's a UFO as they knock out the two pilots that are running away from the ship as they take it for a joyride. They go flying around with this one named Scab piloting it like maniacs as other people the pilots work for find them knocked out as they manage to talk to the Jokers on the ship. The woman demands for the ship to be returned back to them as she says that there's another reason that they have to return it besides from it being government property, but they ignore her. Scab manages to pick up the other Jokers as they cause havoc at a fast food joint where they get free food and leave. Terry sees this going on as he suits up and uses the Batmobile to catch up to them. Batman tries to stop him as they're flying around like maniacs, but they end up shooting down the Batmobile. Jokers decide to get out and fight Batman where he's kicking the crap out of them until they get on the ship and try to kill Batman with the ship. And they're about to hit him, another military vehicle comes out to shoot them as the Jokers fly away. The lady on the military vehicle ends up getting Batman to go on the ship with her as they try to stop them. Batman finds out as they're flying that the fuel cell is going to blow up and that it's nuclear so they need to get people as far away as possible. They catch up with the Jokers as the lady gives Batman a card to stop the fuel cell as she ejects Batman where she manages to damage the ship but almost kills herself, where Batman saves her. Batman then goes after the Jokers as he manages to interrogate one of them that fell off the ship to find out where they're headed next. They're going to take out another hideout of a rival gang known as the Tees, so Batman goes to them where he has to fight them all. The Tees end up leaving as the Jokers show up, but Batman manages to get them stuck in there as he tied up the ship against the support beam which makes the ship crash. The Jokers get out beside Scab as he manages to get Batman underneath him. As he's about to take him out, we see the new recruit knocks out Scab as he gives Batman the chance to stop the fuel cell. The recruit takes his clown nose off as Batman and him leave, where Scab cracks the shits about the ship not working anymore. Damn, this is the weakest episode yet. Personally, I really don't find the Jokers interesting in the slightest. Not even Scab as he doesn't really have an interesting personality at all. It's a very average run of the mill episode, which honestly is not a good thing considering how strong the show has been so far. I don't really have much else to say about the episode because it's honestly just really forgettable. It's probably one of the worst things I could say about an episode of a show. So yeah, it's at the bottom. Plus, Saul starts with a news report as we see that a man named Robert Vance an owner of a Vance computer company, passed away. In his last moments, he decided to create a digital version of himself, and this face is honestly disturbing, but I love it. But that seemed to have been a flashback as we go to the present where Robert's grandson, Bobby, activates his digital self as he doesn't recognize him. We get the news that it's been 35 years since his creation, where Bobby now has to run the company since his father recently passed away from a heart attack. Robert asks to be put online where he wants to find out more about the new world, as we see Dana and Terry as they're looking out at the city. They end up going to the elevator as it malfunctions and goes down fast as they manage to survive. But then it goes up really fast as well as they end up seeing that everything's playing up at the moment since they're seeing lights flicker everywhere. Terry ends up shutting off the elevator as he then gets to Bruce where he finds out that the program's trying to collect as much data as possible and that's why everything's playing up. Terry suits up to go to Gotham Power where he manages to restore the power to most of the city after he gets shot by a laser. He then has to deal with some crooks in parts of the city that still don't have power. After doing so, the suit starts playing up as Robert ends up gaining control of it because he got shot by a laser that Robert was in control of. He throws Batman around as he's taking over and explains that he has to go download himself into a new body as he directs him into the water. Bruce uses the fail safe that he had on the suit, so Terry just stops in the water with his head just above the water level. And as his head goes under, Bruce saves Terry with the Batmobile. Terry takes the suit off as Terry and Bruce leave the cave. The suit seems to control itself. The suit destroyed the fail safe as Terry said that he's going to go after him with or without a bat suit as Bruce gives him the original utility belt as Terry grabs Dick's Nightwing mask. We see that Robert's taken over the suit as he approaches Bobby as he wants to take over his body. He does some scans on him where we find out that the x-ray scan can actually get rid of Robert's control of the suit as Terry comes in to stop Robert. He ends up doing a bit of damage to the suit until he manages to actually overpower him and this is cool but also strange when Robert disappears from the suit. We then see Bobby as he sells off the company and the episode ends with Bruce and Terry as Bruce is repairing the suit. Terry says that he can use the rest, but Bruce says that it's only the suit that's out of commission, not Batman. Okay, yep, yeah, this episode's much better. It's pretty cool seeing a computer program, which is basically a virus, just take over almost everything in Gotham. But I wish we got to see more of Robert's presence and everything he took over, since it only seemed like he had a big presence in the Bat suit. It's a little disappointing since Robert's digital design is honestly quite creepy, but also really cool. They could have just done more with it. Like, look at this design. It's honestly really creepy, but it looks really good. I still really like this episode. It's nothing amazing, but it's still good and enjoyable overall. It goes above splices, but below Earthmover.
Let's see if they have a hidden agenda, eh? <laughs> but it starts with the man as he gets into the train, where he finds the Jokers inside. One of them uses a spray can on him as they then use the emergency stop and leave him on there with sharp teeth that are after him. Batman sees him as we then see the main one in the group named Terminal goes to get some sleep after dropping one of the other Jokers off the side of the building. We then see Terry with Dana and Max as they check their GAT scores as Max got a perfect score and Terry didn't even get one since he had an emergency. As they leave we see this guy named Wilson as he sees that Max got a perfect score and that he scored just below her. So Wilson congratulates her as we then see that Max did a report on Batman. She has quite a bit of data as she seems to know that Terry's possibly Batman, but we then see Wilson's mother as she says that he did so poorly in his GATs. As his mother leaves, we see that Wilson's actually terminal as he puts the makeup on and messes with the GAT scores at the school. After their time at the school, we see Terry with Dana and Max in the morning as the school's a mess and people are trying to clean it up. Terry knows that one of the Jokers must go to their school and as Max opens her locker, a pie comes flying at her as she narrowly avoids it. But that night, Terry suits up to deal with the Jokers as he knows what they're up to. He ends up stopping most of them besides Terminal, as Batman sees that they have Max's keycard to access her information. But speaking of Terminal, we see Max at the school as Terminal controls two cleaning devices to try and shoot acid at Max, but Batman saves her. Terry then goes to talk to Max as she tells her to get rid of the research on Batman, as she'll be in danger. She goes to delete it all, and then she decides to get a list of potential matches to who could be living a double life. Terry's the first name on the list, where she thinks that he's a joker, as she makes subtle suggestions to what she believes about him. She ends up telling her to meet at some place at 8 to discuss her theory, as the Jokers see her at the place that she's going to see Terry at. They approach her as Terry only saw the email at the time they were meant to meet, but Terminal explains that they've been following Max and that none of them are Terry. He explains that he doesn't care about her data on who could be Batman, and as Terminal's going to attack Max, Batman comes out to stop the Jokers. Batman ends up dealing with them as they realize that Terminal is Wilson. The next day, Max ends up talking to Terry as she reveals that she thought he was a Joker, but she now knows that he's Batman. The episode then ends after this honestly funny exchange. You call me Robin? And I'm out of here. No problem. Alfred. It's a pretty solid episode. I don't have too much to say about this episode, but what I do have to say is that I like how Max ended up realizing the truth about Terry over time. It seemed believable that she ended up coming to the conclusion that Terry is Batman by the end, considering that Terminal straight up told her that Terry isn't a joker. Also, as Terminal goes, he's alright. Nothing too special, kind of a standard villain as motivation goes, but honestly, that makeup looks like Casey Jones' hockey mask from the TMNT franchise. This episode's above splices but below lost soul. Blood sports starts with the man going to his penthouse as they seem to look fucking pissed and then kill a mosquito with a blow dart after it bites him. We then see Batman as he takes down a gang as they've been stealing cars and he manages to do so in their factory. The next morning Terry's awoken by Terry's mum as she asks about the milk. Terry says he forgot as he apologises but she asks if he can pitch in a bit more as Terry ends up saying he will. We then see that the guys completely change the penthouse as they have tribal clothing on and call themselves the Stalker. They end up drawing Batman's attention by breaking into a tribal arts gallery where he starts to attack Batman. They fight for a while until he throws a smoke bomb at him and disappears by blending into a wall. Terry goes to babysit his brother Matt as his mum's going to go for a test as he takes Matt to some food joint with arcade games. Whilst there, Terry runs into Max and he also sees the Stalker as he's after him. So he tries to run away from him whilst making Max watch Matt, but he can't lose him. Even after gigging on the train, he still keeps up. But as passengers get off the train, Terry puts a jacket on someone else as he manages to lose the stalker. Terry goes back to the Batcave as Bruce tells him how the stalker was so easily able to track him, as we then see Matt in captivity as the stalker explains his weird scarring on his back. He says that as he was hunting, he was careless, as a panther broke his back in five places where he ended up getting a backbone replaced as it enhanced his strength and reflexes. He then got revenge on the panther as he got bored of hunting in the jungle because it was too easy until he heard about Batman where he wanted to have an actual challenge. So is this guy just a Craven the Hunter ripoff? Yeah, pretty much. So as he's explaining it all, Batman comes in and fights the Stalker as he's set up his penthouse for this exact occasion. Batman ends up defeating him after electrocuting him, where his vision plays up to where he sees everything as the Panther that damaged him, as he then gets hit by a train as Batman couldn't save him. The episode ends as Matt tells his mum about what happened, where I don't think she completely believes it. You know what? This episode's pretty good. Even though the Stalker's basically Craven, I still like the character. A very straightforward character and that's what works well since they literally just want to kill Batman as a challenge and it works. The design of the Stalker could have been cooler but overall it's still an enjoyable episode. It goes above Lost Soul but below Earth Mover. This episode starts with a bunch of criminals playing poker. They all mention that they have places to be as this guy, Benny, takes a while to make his move. Benny thinks that he heard something so he gets the guards to check as we then see 10 breaking in. Damn, I really didn't expect to see her back so soon. So eventually, Benny plays his hand as Ten comes in and steals all the winnings, and she then makes her escape as she's being shot at. 
Batman overhears all the gunshots, so he goes to stop them as he sees Tendra on escape with a bag. Batman grabs it off her and throws it back to them, but they keep on shooting so Batman has to take them down. He does so as Ten gets away, and eventually Batman leaves as one of them are shooting at him. Terry back at the Batcave finds out from Bruce that this poker game is a high stakes game called the Derby that has been around Gotham for a very long time and it attracts most of Gotham's criminals. When Terry gets home, he sees Melanie in his room, which is odd since she never went to or saw Terry's house in the episode Dead Man's Hand. But she explains that she didn't have a choice with what she had to do before and that she's stuck between him or her family and she says that she needs a place to stay for a little while. Terry's a bit skeptical about her when she says that she had to rob a big poker game because of the Jokers because apparently they have their family, which explains why the authorities are after her. Terry is about to ring the police as Dana calls him, and after he gets off the phone with her, Melanie kisses Terry. Dog is down bad. Feels bad for Dana. So she stays at Terry's for a few hours until she ends up leaving as his family gets home. After that, Terry goes to talk to Max about the derby to try and find out where it potentially is being held. She gets Terry some photos of where the game's held, as we then see the game as Ten's planning to rob them again, where Batman tries to stop her. He eventually gets her off her flying card as he tells her to stop stealing where she shows him where her family's being held. Batman and Ten they make them move to break in and save the family as they have to fight a lot of jokers off. Eventually Batman gets trapped in a room full of jokers after interrogating one where he seems to know nothing about the Royal Flush game being with them. He gets out as Bruce gave him the Batmobile to escape where Ten goes back to the derby to rob them. She does so and gets away as Terry explains what he did to Bruce. Terry put a tracker on her as we see Ten go to where her family are, as her dad comes out and tells her that there were never any jokers, and that the ransom was just a thing he set up. It was a test to make sure that her family could trust her, where she's shitty at them for doing this to her, and making her choose between Terry and her family. As she's talking to her parents, Batman comes in as her dad makes them fight Batman, as Ten has to make her choice on if she wants to stay with her family. So Batman fights them for a bit until Batman gets knocked down, as the crooks that were playing the poker game come in guns blazing as Batman tipped them off. The Royal Flush gang run for it as Batman ends up stopping them as the police arrive and they all get arrested besides from Ten as she got away. The episode ends as Terry's with Dana at a nightclub as Terry throws out the note from Melanie. That's cold as fuck. But yeah, this episode's a pretty similar quality to Dead Man's Hand. It's basically the same thing as the first episode with the Royal Flush gang, but with the gang setting her daughter up to see if they can trust her after the events of the first episode. I personally don't think that we needed this episode, especially with Melanie coming back as a potential love interest for Terry. I just thought that ship had already sailed at this point, but apparently not. Terry should have shrugged her off considering that he's with Dana, but there's nothing I can do about it. Goes above splices but below hidden agenda. This episode came out on the day I was born. Fun fact for you all. So it starts with some rock concert, and let me say that the lyrics are terrible, but I think it's meant to be intentionally bad. Anywho, the singer named Donny finishes his show as he walks past a bunch of his fans and even this woman says that he can sign anywhere he wants as she's pulling a top up. I'm kind of surprised they got away with this on a kid's show. But he ends up getting in a limo with three women as his simulation ends, where we see a bunch of people in a simulation as a man tells him that he knows what to do if he wants to get back in the simulation. I recognize that voice, but I don't want to spoil who the villain is for you all. We then go to Donny as he's asking for money, but he gets shitty at one person and ends up robbing them. As that's going on, Batman's talking to Bruce as he explains that Max wants to get more involved, as they don't want her to, and I really like this exchange. Will you relax? I feel the same way you do, for once. But she's been a big help to me, how do I tell her no? You're asking me for advice on handling women? As he's talking to Bruce, Batman sees Donnie robbing people for credits, so he confronts him where he makes a run for it and almost kills himself. Batman saves him until he ends up falling again and causing a road accident, as Batman has to try and stop the cars from crashing into the trailer. Max goes back where it's revealed to be Spellbinder, as he lets Donnie go back into his false reality. We then see this fast food worker on a date with a manager named Jesse, as he ends up asking her to marry him, where we see that Jesse was the one in the simulation as she seems to have passed out when being pulled out by Spellbinder. We then see Bruce as he explains to Terry that everyone in these false realities have ended up in hospitals because they've overdosed on serotonin thanks to the visions that Spellbinder is providing them. To get into some sciencey stuff, serotonin is basically a chemical that can affect your physical and mental health. Bruce thought of it after Batman dealt with Donnie as he might end up in the same state. Later on, Terry and Max go to Donnie's place as Max knows his parents, and that's the only reason why he brought her along. They end up seeing that the whole place is a mess, as his parents come out where his father seems to be the abusive type, as he tells Max and Terry that if they find him, he doesn't want him to come back. Luckily, Terry took one of the used cred cards from his room, as they find out that he's been using them in a VR room to escape reality. Max and Terry go to an arcade as it has some VR simulators, as we then see Donnie with two other guys that have been using Spellbinder's VR simulations as one of them approaches Max. He tells her about the VR setups across town, where Max ends up being pulled in to go alone after Terry seems reluctant about it. As Max is pulled away, Donnie and the other guy tell Terry about it as Donnie mentions that Spellbinder hooks them up, so Terry has to fight both of them after trying to get Max. 
He loses her as we then see Max get home as she eats dinner with her folks, as we see that it's all a simulation as Spellbinder got her in there. Max ends up looking for more credit cards as Batman confronts her, as she's trying to steal more money to get back in the simulation, where Batman puts her to sleep and takes her to her house. She explains that her parents split up and that it's mostly just her and her sister at her place most of the time, and as Terry calls Bruce, Max knocks him out as she goes back to Spellbinder. Terry suits up as he ends up seeing Donnie as he follows him to where Spellbinder is. Batman then goes in as he sees Donnie on the ground almost passing out. He ends up pulling Max out of the simulation as he confronts her, where Spellbinder gets the jump on Batman. She goes back into the simulation where Spellbinder makes everything that has happened so far in the show flash before his eyes, as Max gets the jump on Spellbinder and knocks him out. The episode ends with Terry talking to Max as she apologizes for what she did, and that she wanted to be a part of something, as Terry says that she's a part of it now, but they'll take things a bit slower from now on. Fuck, these episodes are really good, even though it's basically just a giant metaphor for drugs. I noticed that this is a common thing for this show to have episodes that are just metaphor for addictions and most notably drugs, and I think this one does it the best. Using VR as a metaphor to where you're literally escaping reality works very well since these things like drugs and alcohol are commonly used to escape reality and are things that people abuse to try and feel good. Also, tying Spellbinder into this works well, and I honestly like how he doesn't have that much of a presence in the episode itself, besides from being the one that created the different VR simulations that just feel more real and end up affecting your mental and physical health. This might be a bit controversial, but I think this is the best episode of the season yet. It has nothing to do with it being released on the same day I was born, but I really like it. Rats starts with a news report as they're talking about giant man-eating rats, as Max, Chelsea, and Dana are eating, where Dana's pissed off at Terry, but he ends up arriving late. Terry apologizes as Dana gets pissed at him, whilst Chelsea and Max just watch the drama unfold, as Dana leaves, where Max stays with Terry. We then see Terry at home as Dana rings him. She talks about the flowers in her car, where he's confused about it, but she asks him to meet her tonight. Dana's dad doesn't approve of her seeing Terry, as she ends up going anyway, even after apparently hearing something outside. As Terry's on his way, Bruce brings him in to do some Batman things, so he quickly suits up and deals with the situation, which ends up being a guy setting up bombs in the library. The guy's name is Mad Stan, it's just not established here. Batman gets his ass kicked until he manages to knock him out after a bomb goes off, where we see that Dana's leaving as she sees flowers again. When she grabs him, she sees two giant rats and passes out. She wakes up in some random place as a rat-looking man comes out to say that his rats are his friends, that his name is Patrick. She wonders why he knows so much about her, as he then shows her all the things that he's collected. He ends up showing her all of the flowers that he's been growing, as he says that he wants her to stay with him. Batman tries to find her, as he then sees something going on at the place he has meant to meet Dana, as he fights the two giant rats, and they end up making a run for it. Batman then decides to go in the sewers to find Dana, as we see her wandering around the place as she's going to leave Patrick. She ends up going through a whole sewer system, until she runs into a bunch of rats, as Patrick sees her. He takes her back, where she gets shitty at him, as Patrick turns on her and makes her rats attack her, as Batman comes in to stop him. The whole place ends up accidentally blowing up after a stick that Dana lit up ends up landing in a bunch of toxic waste, as Batman and Dana make it out with no sign of Patrick. The episode ends as Terry sees Dana, as they walk off together whilst the flower with a note floats away. I'm not a big fan of this episode. It's honestly just very basic and forgettable, to the point where I feel like I have nothing to say about the episode itself. It's a typical person that doesn't fit in becoming a villain trope after things don't go their way, and it's honestly kind of boring. Bottom of the list. I hope that this episode's better, and it starts with some guys flying around with his wife and daughter, as we see Batman flying around, as he's talking to Max listing off previous presidents. The car with the family inside ends up almost crashing after a thunderstorm as Batman saves them, where the parents seem to act weirdly. The next day, Terry's at his history exam, where he sees a girl from last night coming up to her asking for his help, and that she doesn't want to go. She won't go away as he's doing his exam, but he then tells Bruce about this afterwards, where she comes up again and says that her name's Tamara. Terry asks where she is, as she then shows Terry where she lives, as the parents then get shitty with her, knowing that she's calling someone. They figure out that they're at the Gotham Park Towers, as one of the pillows has GPT on them. As Terry decides to go there with Max undercover, he goes into the apartment with his bat suit as the dad starts to fight Batman. He eventually throws him out the window, where he lands on the ground and seems completely unharmed. Terry goes back to the Batcave, where we end up finding out that the girl's currently reported missing, as Terry suits up to talk to Tamara's real parents. They explain that they're going to take her to a special school for her abilities, but they find out that the school was completely bogus, and they tell Batman where the supposed school is. Batman goes to look at it as he ends up finding the man that spoke to the woman that has Tamara captive, where he ends up doing weird things to him that honestly look awesome. But the guy throws Batman around for a bit until he's about to kill him, Batman manages to knock him out, and he just leaves. Terry goes back home as he tries to figure out where she is by talking to Max about it, where he wants Tamara to talk to him. She ends up whispering to him where he finds out that she's on a boat that's near Loading Bay 7, as he decides to suit up to save her. Batman takes out a few guards and ends up listening into the woman, as she's talking to Tamara where she explains that they can change the world. 
She doesn't want to, she just wants to go home as Batman comes in after she leaves as they both try to get off the boat. Batman has to end up fighting them, but Tamara ends up using her power to help Batman out with the woman as he still has to fight the man. He has Batman in a headlock, but Tamara uses her power on him to make him blind as they end up leaving. The episode ends with Terry talking to Max as Tamara and her parents end up being put under protective custody, but we see a vision of Tamara waving to Terry as he says that he has a feeling that they're doing just fine. Yeah, it's pretty good. Definitely nothing amazing, but the one thing that stands out to me is the vision to Tamara that Terry keeps on seeing after running into her when saving them. I think the twist that the two adults with her aren't her parents was predictable, but the whole part of her being missing and her parents trying to find her was a surprise, but a good one. One thing that I thought was going to be true is that the blonde man was going to be a robot. Well, that's just how it felt to me since his movement and his attitude seemed very robotic. I kind of wish that was the case because it would have been a really cool twist. But I actually like this episode quite a lot, much better than the last one. It goes above Hidden Agenda but below Lost Soul. Revenant. If you're wondering about an afterlife, there is none. No, not that Revenant. Starts with Terry at school as he ends up seeing a bunch of trophies on the roof, whilst Chelsea and Dana are looking at it. People believe it to be the ghost of Garrison Jacobs, as they apparently died when the school was building the East Wing, as this isn't the first time that they had something like this happen. We then see Dana with Chelsea and two other girls as they use it on a Ouija board, where Nelson walks in and tries to hit on them as they tell him to get lost. Nelson kicks the board as it ends up flying into his head, and then the whole place starts having the fire extinguishers go off and lights exploding as the girls run out of the room. Batman ends up seeing this going on as he sees that this invisible person seems to be after Nelson as Batman tries to save him and ends up doing so by getting him out of the window. Terry seems to start to actually believe that a ghost is trying to get revenge as Bruce doesn't believe that it's a ghost and that there will be a reasonable explanation for what's going on. The next day at school, the girls' bathroom seems to be having issues as the water starts spraying at them as the girls end up running out. They go back in after the water's off as they see writing on the mirror saying, I still love you. We then see Terry with Dana, and this line's honestly hilarious. Boy in the girls showers. Why didn't I think of that? What? N never mind. So they end up connecting the dots with Nelson and Blade to see that it's Willie Watt coming back for revenge as he attacked Nelson but left a message for Blade. Terry goes to visit him in jury as he sees Willie's in good shape and that he might potentially be out in two months as he says that he wants to go to the gym when it's fixed. Terry questions him on how he knows that the gym's broken as no one visits him as he ends up finding out that Willie has telekinetic powers after throwing a glass of water at him. Terry knows that he's using the powers to mess with the school where Willie says that he could break out if he wants to, but he just wants to wait the two months to get out on good behavior. Willie tells Terry to keep his secret when he says that he will he gets escorted out of the building since Terry's visiting time's up. But Willie starts to attack the guards and escapes through the roof using his powers. Terry then gets Barbara to cancel the school classes for the day as all the school kids leave. We see Willie attack Nelson as he's driving away from school, where he makes him crash into the school. Also, I just realized that Nelson is voiced by Seth Green. I don't know how it took me this long to realize that. So after Nelson says that it isn't fair that Willie has powers, they start to fist fight until Willie uses his powers to throw Nelson off him. He goes to kiss Blade where Batman comes in to stop them, but they end up fighting for a bit as Nelson destroyed the gun that would put him to sleep. They fight for a while until Batman manages to catch him off guard where Willie accidentally uses his powers against himself, knocking himself out. The episode ends with Terry talking to Matt as he says that Matt doesn't remember his dad, that he'll always be alive as long as he remember him. Another good episode. I will start off by saying that this episode personally isn't as good as Golem in my opinion, but I still enjoyed it. I kind of wish that there was more of a mystery as to who was doing all these things that were going on in the school, but we do get to see Willy back at least. I don't really have too much to say about this episode, but I will say that I would actually like to see Willy turn his life around in the future. I think it would be a satisfying character arc, but hopefully we get something like that in the future of the show. Goes above once burned but below hidden agenda. So we start this episode off with Terry at the Batcave as Bruce is fixing the bat suit, where Bruce is telling a story about how sometimes you have to walk into a trap even without knowing that someone's going to save you. As they're talking, all of a sudden Ace gets aggressive at both of them, where Terry uses a tranquilizer dart on Ace to make him calm down. So Terry takes him to the vet where a lot of people seem to have animals that are extra aggressive. Max is there where she says that she's glad that she isn't near a zoo. After hearing that, Terry suits up to try and stop the aggressive animals at the zoo. Batman ends up dealing with them until all of a sudden they stop being aggressive. Terry goes back to the Batcave as the disturbance happened at 12 and stopped at 2, as they figure out that it was a sound frequency causing the animals to be aggressive where they know that it was Shriek behind this. We see Shriek as he wants revenge on Batman for making him deaf besides from when he's in the suit, as he gives his assistant Ollie a fork that gives him sound frequencies that makes him extra happy to say the least. Terry finds out that he apparently got cured for his deafness, where their speech ends up being mixed up as Terry just puts on the suit and hopefully puts a stop to Shriek, where Bruce and Terry are talking over text instead. As Batman's out, he has to save people after they failed to land a shipment properly because of the miscommunication going on, thanks to Shriek. 
As Barbara is talking to an officer, the frequency stops where Shriek rings to say if they kill Batman, they'll stop what's happening with the sound frequencies. Bruce and Terry try to find where Shriek is as Barbara rings Bruce and says that she has a plan as Shriek wants Batman. Terry ends up seeing Max to talk about what he should do, as the news says that Shriek says that he'll give them all a lethal dose of the sound frequencies if Batman doesn't show up. As he then suits up to potentially deal with Shriek, as he figures out that the building that he's at is a way of sending out the frequencies since it's shaped like a giant fork. Batman gets to Shriek as they fight, and as they're fighting he uses the frequencies against everyone in Gotham, as Batman manages to destroy one of the machines as the place starts to collapse. The fork ends up falling under Shriek as he says Batman's dead. The episode ends with Terry talking to Bruce at the Batcave as they're repairing the suit, as Bruce thanks him for reminding him why he became Batman, and asks Terry if he would have handed himself over even if he didn't know how to beat Shriek, as Terry says that they have a suit to repair. They really managed to make Shriek an actual threat to Batman, that's what I like about this episode. Glad that the show managed to do something interesting with Shriek, as he wants revenge for what happened in his last encounter with Batman. Solid episode overall, but I do think that the episode starts off kinda weak and just gets better and better after that. All the Batman stuff in this episode is honestly really good, but Terry ends up putting himself in a situation that he doesn't even know he can get out alive just to save Gotham. That's really the best stuff about this episode, so it goes above Bloodsport but below Mind Games. What a strange title for an episode of this show. At least we know that this isn't going to be that serious of an episode, which can be a good thing or a bad thing. So it starts with Batman in a fight with some of Bruce's old rogues gallery, as Bruce gives Terry advice on how to defeat villains. He ends up doing so as it's all revealed to be a simulation, where we then see Nelson as a nerdy kid named Howard comes up to him with some really goofy music. He invited them to his place as he's going to have a big party, as Nelson says that he probably won't. He then invites Blade and Chelsea as well as he spoke to Nelson and a bunch of other people about it, where Terry and Dino are seeing Howard do this. He ends up inviting them both as they end up actually saying yes, where they tell him that he doesn't need to invite everyone, but sometimes the less is better. He ends up letting Howard come with him as Terry's running an errand for Bruce to replace one of the robot heads in the simulation. Howard overhears a worker talking about a robot woman as he says that he wants a robot girlfriend, but the worker makes a girl to his specifications. The next day the woman he created shows up at school as Nelson tries to flirt with her. She shrugs him off as they then go to Howard as he comes up with the name Cynthia for her as they leave. Later that day, Nelson wants to try and put Howard in his place, as Cynthia ends up nearly killing Nelson by pushing lockers onto him. Dana, Terry and a few others find out about what happened to Nelson, as Cynthia seems suspicious where Howard pulls her away. Terry thinks that she's suspicious as he goes to look at the boys' locker room. He finds handprints as Max comes to look at it with him, as the boys are coming into the locker room she hides in a locker. We then see that Howard seems to be getting with popular people as even Chelsea hits on Howard and Cynthia seems to be getting jealous. As Chelsea walks away, Cynthia tries to make a sign fall on her where Terry confronts her. She ends up punching Terry where he lands on the sign making it fall as he then manages to soften the fall. Terry suits up as he knows that she's a robot, so he ends up catching up to the worker that's been creating the robots. He ends up setting some robots in Batman where he manages to take him out pretty easily and ties up the worker as he tells him to get a good lawyer. We then see Howard's party as both Dana and Chelsea hit on Howard, as Cynthia knocks Chelsea over where Howard pulls Cynthia into a room to talk to her about how obsessive she is. She ends up malfunctioning and going after Howard as Max tries to help him. But as Cynthia is about to throw a couch, Batman comes in to stop her. Howard tries to talk to her to say that they can still be friends, where she ends up exploding as Batman gets Howard out in time as Howard seems to be some kind of legend for blowing up his own house. The episode ends with his parents getting back as they're shitty with him, so Terry, Dana and Max leave. This episode's alright. Honestly, nothing too special. It's just kind of forgettable, but it's an alright episode and it doesn't take itself that seriously. It's kind of funny that Howard becomes the cool guy just because he seems to have an attractive partner, but I think that this episode goes above Joyride but below Splices. Eyewitness starts with a truck delivery as Batman's watching over them. Batman ends up interrupting by taking most of them down until a few of them manage to drive away. It ended up actually being a sting operation as Barbara seems pissed at Batman for blowing their sting operation on the gangsters. Barbara talks to Bruce at Wayne Manor as Barbara tells Bruce about what happened and that this mistake better be his last. We then see Barbara with Sam as he's going for district attorney again as Mad Stan comes in exploding things and threatening them all with bombs. Batman comes in and manages to stop his explosives and take off his bomb vest where he makes a run for it. He ends up shooting a bunch of explosives at Batman and then manages to knock Mad Stan out where it seems like he's trying to kill him. Barbara tells him to stop and oh shit, he actually kills him but Batman ends up getting away. The next day we see Terry as officers are questioning his mother on his whereabouts as she doesn't know where Terry is as he manages to avoid him. We see Bruce at the back cave as Barbara says that Bruce needs to hand him in when Terry's back, but as Barbara leaves Terry rings. Terry says that he's confused as to why the police are after him, as Bruce says that he killed someone where Terry's confused and says that all he did is knock him out with his elbow. Bruce says that Barbara was an eyewitness to him killing Mad Stan, but says for Terry to tell him where he is, 
He ends up saying that is at Max's place. Bruce ends up finding the security footage of the parking garage, but the murder took place at where it seems to stop as he grabs onto the barrel and then comes back as Barbara is shooting at Batman. Terry waits at Max's place as Bruce rings him telling him about the interference with the cameras as Bruce seems to believe Terry since it seems like too much of a coincidence. Bruce is trying to fix the security footage as he says that he needs to examine Mad Stan's body. He goes to the morgue to find out that his body's not there. Batman hears something as he notices that the alarms were tripped, but the police are on him. He makes a run for it and eventually escapes after stealing a police car. He ends up dumping the car and after another run in with Barbara, Bruce gets the footage back to see that someone was behind them making Barbara see something else as we see that Terry just dropped the barrel after stopping it. Batman's still fighting with the police as he then manages to see Spellbinder behind them and takes him out as he hands him into the police and explains the things that Barbara saw. Barbara apologizes to Terry and talks to Bruce where the episode ends with Mad Stan in a simulation where he's blowing things up. This episode fucks. I really like this episode a lot since the whole scenario of the police being after Batman is very similar to the new Batman Adventures episode, Over the Edge. Instead, with this episode, Barbara sees Batman killed Mad Stan and then orders the police after him as Batman has to prove his innocence and reveal that it was Spellbinder. And it's so well done. Even though it was kind of obvious that it was Spellbinder, the episode doesn't really focus on that and mainly just focuses on the fact that Terry has to prove his innocence and prove that Batman didn't kill Mad Stan. Now, this is the best episode of the season so far. I really wonder if any other episode in this season will dethrone it. Alright, so this episode starts as a plane lands where men are replacing some part of the plane just so they can fly again. As they are, we see that Kurare is sneaking their way onto the plane, and really? Did we really need to see Kurare again? I just don't think they're that interesting of a character. Like, are they worthy of having another episode? I don't think so. So they take off where the guy on the plane named Devin talks to someone on the phone as they're in Gotham, where they say that Devin's been on a plane for three months because he's worried that Kurare is going to get him. As he says that, she ends up coming in as Devin has to fight her, but we find out that he was a part of the Society of Assassins as well. Eventually, she throws some acid on him, and as she's about to chop his head off, we see that he's already dead. She makes her escape as we then see that Devin's mind was apparently wiped. Yeah, right. That man looks dead. I think it's just the case of the show being censored. So we go to Batman as he's talking to Max, where the guy that was on the phone tries to shoot Batman. He fails as Batman comes up to him. He says that he did it just to get his attention, and that his name is Mutro Botha. Also, holy shit, that's Tim Curry. And he's apparently a part of the Society of Assassins, as Batman is the reason for all this happening. Usually the Society doesn't fail at killing their targets, but Karare did. So now she's been going after all the Society members and that he's the last one left. And after she gets him, she'll go after Batman. Batman doesn't want to help, but Mutro reveals that he planted a bomb in the city, and it will detonate if he doesn't help. Obviously, he has to help as he ends up telling Max about the situation, as Bruce has gone for some business-related thing, but Terry tries to get Max to contact Bruce. So Batman meets up with Mutro as he's using him for bait to confront Kurare, but we see Max wandering around as she ends up looking through Mutro's apartment. She doesn't find much in his hotel room as Kurare attacks her, so Batman rushes in and ends up seeing that she's okay, since Kurare saw her and didn't attack. He tells her to rush home and we see Mutro being attacked by Kurare. They fight as she ends up throwing the acid onto him, which ends up wiping his memory. You can't tell me that he doesn't look dead. Now the big issue is that Mutro can't stop the bomb since his mind's wiped, and now Batman has to sort out the bomb, and they find out that the bomb's located at the Gotham Museum. Terry ends up letting Max come with him as they end up searching the place of the bomb. As they do, Karare attacks Batman as he has to deal with her. He gets Max to look for the bomb where the device accidentally gets destroyed after a barrel off of a tank falls in error. So as they're still fighting, Max finds the bomb in a display of a nuclear bomb as she ends up disarming it at the last second by pulling it out. Batman beats Karare as they end up going back to her place as the episode ends with Max asking how he doesn't tell everyone about how he saves the world. This episode's alright, but it is better than the first episode with Karare. As you know, I don't like Karare as a character since they aren't interesting at all, but I like how she ends up being a big threat in this episode. It's also surprisingly dark with how Karare basically kills people, but instead of killing them, leaves them in a vegetated state. And honestly, I think that's probably just as disturbing and I like it. The episode really isn't anything too special, but it goes above splices and below once burnt. The last resort starts with Batman as he's talking to Max about school relationships, where he sees some ship trying to evade the police. Batman manages to stop them by making them land, as they find out that some guy from history class named Sean Miller was on the ship. We find out that they're in a mental institution, as this guy named Dr. David Wheeler advertises his new mental facility, as the next day at school, Dana and Terry barely see anyone in class. Chelsea mentions that it's Wheeler's facility, as parents have become too scared for their child's safety, and have been sending them to this facility. Chelsea's voice is different. It's Rachel Lee Cook, and you PSA enthusiasts would know exactly why I know that name. After Chelsea messes with the principal over email, we see that she's gone the next day as Terry, Dana, and Max are eating lunch. 
The three of them are wondering what's going on as the ranch seems to be a bit weird. To admit somewhat normal school kids into a mental institution where people have actual mental issues. Chelsea sees a guy named Adam that was known for his art skills as she sees that he's basically a vegetable since he's literally painting nothing, but he thinks he's painting something. They all have to go to class as we see Batman going to look at this facility. He ends up listening into the class as Wheeler completely degrades them in class. Batman tells Bruce about this as he thinks that he's brainwashing all of them since they have no sleep and are deprived of it. Batman accidentally trips the alarm as he manages to get away after a guard tries to shoot him down. The next day, Terry decides to go into the facility by saying that he's going to visit Chelsea. Guard doesn't let him in to visit her, but he gets distracted when Terry sneaks his way in. He manages to talk to Chelsea as she explains what's happening where she ends up crying. Damn, this moment got me a bit. But Terry ends up running into Wheeler after having a little fight with Sean as Wheeler sends him to ISO. Wheeler ends up being suspicious about Terry and makes the guard pat him down where they find the recording device that shows the video of Chelsea. He ends up sending Terry into a room overnight as Wheeler wants to wait and see if anyone comes for him, and if they don't, they'll possibly put an end to Terry. We see Terry in his room as Sean tells him the news about how they're both going to ISO in the morning, but Terry tries to tell Sean to follow along with his plans as it might be a chance for Sean to rehabilitate himself. That morning, they both get to the ISO rooms where Terry and Sean fight the guards. They end up doing so after Adam helped knock one out. They end up letting everyone out as Sean makes a run for the exit as Terry finds his bag and suits up. He ends up fighting one of the guards as he knocks him out. Sean ends up getting Wheeler as he's going to throw him off the building as Batman saves Wheeler and Sean gets sent away. Wheeler gets taken to the police as the episode ends with Bruce and Terry as Terry says that he wishes that we didn't need places like this as Bruce says that he knows. There are some things that I really like about this episode, but as an overall package, it's alright. I feel like this episode should have had more of a focus on how it's affecting all the kids being locked up since their parents sent them there, but we only got a little bit of that. The little bit we got with Chelsea was great since it showed how much they're actually struggling in a situation like this, but you know what? This wasn't the episode we would have got if it wasn't for one particular thing. This was the one main episode in the show that was affected because of the Columbine High School Massacre, which happened on the 20th of April in 1999. So originally this episode was meant to be inspired by the events of the massacre, which was all about a prison that actually showed more of how rough and gritty the prison itself is. It's still somewhat in vain of what the original episode was, but it was heavily censored since it was going to show more of what I wanted to see from this episode, seeing how the facility really affects characters and actually seeing how bad it is. This was the main episode that was affected by the Columbine effect, which basically meant that a lot of kids and teenage media would end up being censored in many different ways. Either way, I still like the episode itself. I just think that Wheeler isn't that interesting, and that there could have been more of a focus on the struggle of kids being in a mental institute. Goes above hidden agenda but below lost soul. We started a private party for Jared as we see that he gets a new car for his birthday as Max, Terry and Dana are at the party. Dana asks Terry to go and dance as we see Jared's stepdad named Jim getting let go from his job as he seems pissed off since he built his division up from nothing. Jim tells his son and wife about the news as he tries to find himself a new job to no luck until he gets an opportunity to make a prototype of an anti-tank weapon by stealing some specs and then making it. He ends up stealing them by suiting up as a person named Armory and as he's driving away the police chase him where he easily gets rid of them. Batman comes in to stop him as they fight for a while as he ends up getting away where Batman's hand stuck to a wall and makes the paint in his car change colour. Jim meets a guy named Hegadash as he's given a tax free card as his payment and he says that he was close to being taken down by Batman. Jim, back at his place, ends up getting shitty at his wife as we see Max and Terry at the record store as Jared walks by. She walks away as Terry asks what's wrong with Jared as he seems to be acting strange because his stepdad is acting strange and barely spends time with him anymore. When Jared leaves, Max comes back where Terry explains the coincidences with Jared's dad since not long after he got let go from Wayne Powers, it gets robbed for top secret files. That night, Terry ends up following Jim as he suits up and ends up robbing Gotham Industrial Electronics where the police arrive. Armory manages to deal with them by taking their power out as Batman comes in to deal with Armory. Armory manages to hit Batman as he's flying, knocking his electronics out and then he tries to run Batman over. After failing, he then resorts to shooting Batman but misses as Batman seems to have run away as Armory leaves. The police cars go ablaze as Batman manages to put out the fire by using a giant truck full of sand to stop most of it and save the police. Jared ends up finding out a code that lets him into Jim's secret facility where he sees what his dad's been up to and that he stole the tech from Wayne Powers. His dad comes back with Hegadesh and as he's looking through the room he hides. Jared finds out that his dad is Armory and accidentally gets himself exposed after a spider crawls onto him. Jared explains that him and his mum are worried about him as his mother finds out too. Jim explains himself as Jared's mum and Jared thinks that he shouldn't have done this and that it wasn't okay. As they're arguing Batman comes in to stop them as Hegadesh uses the weapon against Batman. 
Hegadesh ends up getting Batman caught under some rubble as Jim uses his weapons against Hegadesh where they end up fighting. Batman stops him as the episode ends with Terry, Jared and Max at school as the court gave Jim a light sentence. This episode's okay. I honestly just don't find it that interesting, but it's honestly just a very run-of-the-mill episode. Nothing particularly memorable at all, but it's still not bad. It's like you don't really care about Jared and his family that much since they only showed up in one or two episodes, and in those episodes they're in it for like two seconds. They were mainly in Spellbound, but that's just because Jared's mum got affected by Spellbinder, and that's it. He goes above Joyride, but below Terry's friend dates a robot. Let's see what this sneak peek's about, hey? It starts with a show called The Inside Peak as a reporter named Ian Peak, as he basically exposes people throughout Gotham for doing certain things, such as Jamie splicing herself, as he then reveals news about Paxton. He reveals that he's flirting with women, and as Terry's watching it, his mother turns it off, as she makes a great point. You wouldn't find it so entertaining if you were on the receiving end. The show ends for the night as we then go to two men walking into a private room, as we see some figure, which is probably Ian, walk through the walls, and follow them into a room as they end up talking to the DA, Sam. The guy named Mr. Ling spills the beans about the tong, as Ian records what Ling's saying, as Sam thinks that someone's watching them. Ian leaves as Sam tries to see if anyone's watching, where Sam couldn't find him. Ian knocks out an officer as he ends up escaping through the wall, as Batman gets alerted. Batman runs into Ian as he doesn't have any luck catching him, since he's basically untouchable, where Ian kicks his ass. He ends up leaving though as he lights the place up, where Terry gets knocked out from an explosion. Ian ends up turning off the belt as he escapes. At science class the next day, Terry ends up asking the teacher about how solids can move through other solid objects by vibrating a certain way. Terry talks to Bruce at the Batcave as a previous employee of his was doing tests on this and developed the theory called Vibraspace, but he died in a fire with his research. We then see Ian on his program shot in the video of Ling. As the program ends, he seems to be having stomach issues as he swallows tablets. Batman comes out and talks about how him or one of his employees figured out how to move through walls, where Mr. Ling attacks Ian. They come in guns blazing as Ian escapes and hides near the Batmobile, as Batman deals with Ling and his thugs. Batman ends up leaving after tying them down as Batman talks to Bruce where we see that Ian planted a camera on the Batmobile as he sees Bruce and even sees that Terry is Batman. Terry wakes up the next morning as Matt tells him that Batman's on TV where Ian says that he's going to reveal Batman's identity and his accomplice tonight on his show. Bruce rings him as he tells Terry that Ian planted a camera on the Batmobile and destroys it as he knew it would be revealed someday but he's annoyed that someone like Ian was able to do it. Speaking of Ian, Batman pays him a visit as he tells Ian that he doesn't care what he does to him but doesn't want Batman's legacy ruined. Later that day, Terry sees his mum and Matt making popcorn as they're gonna watch the inside peak, and Terry almost exposes himself for this line. Aren't you the one who didn't want us watching this? Uh, you said I wouldn't find it so entertaining if I was on the receiving end. Just before the program starts, we see that Ian's stomach is really sore, as he sees that the effect of the belt starting to permanently affect him as it's growing on his stomach. But before the program starts, Terry tells Matt and his mum that he's Batman as they just laugh at him. But lucky for Terry, the program ended up being postponed, so Terry rings Bruce and he doesn't answer. We see that Bruce got called in to see Ian, and his body's tearing itself apart as he was the last person to see Taka, as he stole his research and the belt from him. It's revealed that Ian actually killed Taka and he's trying to ask Bruce for help. Bruce says no as Ian tries to fight Bruce, and even tries to throw him off the building as Batman comes in. Ian has a gun on them both, but starts to fall through the ground as his whole body's untouchable. Fuck, that is a dark fate for a character. The episode ends with Bruce explaining what will happen to Ian since he just keeps falling through the earth. Fuck, that ending is awesome and it overshadows the rest of the episode. I'm surprised with how dark of an ending this episode has with him just falling through the ground to eventually die when it gets too hot. It's honestly awesome in a disturbing way. The rest of the episode's still good though, especially when Ian ends up getting dirt on Terry and Bruce, as Ian actually becomes a massive threat and could potentially blow their cover if the belt didn't end up affecting him. I really like this episode a lot and it's one of the best in this season so far. Goes above hooked up a blow eyewitness. What a weird title for an episode. I hope that we get to see an actual egg baby like Humpty Dumpty in this episode. So it starts with two men and a woman as they break into someone's house. The one named Ma Mayhem tells them to do what she says and he won't get hurt where they end up making him show them where the safe is. Also, is this guy voiced by Andy Dick? Holy shit it is. I only recognize the voice because of Boingo and Hoodwink. So they end up getting into the safe where Ma Mayhem just takes a ruby ring. Bruce then talks to Terry about what's going on as they only seem to be taking ruby rings. Terry runs into a family studies class as they have to take care of egg babies for a week and they get given one and pairs it too. Terry gets Blade as a partner where he basically has to take care of it even when he suits up to deal with Ma. He ends up getting spotted as the egg baby cries but he has to take one of them on as he's getting shot at. They end up getting away and after seeing students deal with their egg babies, Terry talks to Bruce at the Batcave as they find out where Ma's going to hit next and Terry ends up taking the baby with him again since it's asleep. 
Batman leaves it on the roof as he goes to deal with Mars. They all fight Batman. They end up making a run for it as Batman finds out where he placed the baby was actually in their getaway car disguised as a vent. So now Batman has to find the egg baby and take down Ma as they end up finding them after tracking the cries from the egg baby. They end up following it as Ma orders Carl to throw it as Batman manages to save the egg baby as Ma and the other two shoot at Batman. They go to make a run for it as Batman catches up to them and eventually Batman cuts the powers at the car as he confronts them on the rooftop. He manages to knock the two guys out as he has to fight Ma until Batman makes her handbag drop off the side of the building where she goes after it as Batman saves her. The episode ends with Terry in Family Studies class as he ends up getting the best grade out of any of them in the class. You know what? The episode wasn't serious at all, but I kind of like it because of that. It's just a silly fun episode where Terry has to take care of a fake baby even when he's Batman and it definitely does well at doing that. It's just nothing amazing, but it's still an enjoyable episode which I ended up enjoying more than I thought I would. I think it's because the episode doesn't try and take itself seriously at all is why a weird idea for an episode like this works. The only weak point is the villains since they aren't interesting besides from finding out that one of them is Boingo. Goes above final cut but below once burned. So does this episode have anything to do with the Zeta project? So we'll find out. Zeta starts with the classes they're talking about human behaviors and if it's possibly determined beforehand by biological or environmental influences. We then see Terry and Max walking out of class as they think something's weird about the teacher herself. Miss Martellas, we then see that there's something or someone called Zeta as people are after them. The men are chasing after Zeta in a car chase as Batman suits up and sees that Zeta manages to break out through the roof of her car after it crashed. They come out guns blazing as they end up being revealed to be a sentient robot that can disguise itself to be anyone or anything. Later that day we follow Barbara as she ends up talking to one of the guys chasing after Zeta named Bennett as he explains what's going on to Barbara as Batman listens in. After explaining what Zeta is, Bennett leaves as Barbara talks to Batman about how she doesn't like how Bennett's waging war on the streets. At the school, Max somehow got access to secret government files on Zeta that we just saw, and as she's looking at the files, Dana walks in. After that, we see Max as we realize that it's actually Zeta since they're using Max as a disguise, and we then see that Max is tied up. Zeta ends up going to the school as Terry talks to them. Terry realizes that Max isn't actually Max as they act stranger than usual, so Terry decides to go and watch where they're going. Zeta ends up going to a factory as Max is trying to escape, but Zeta gives her food and ends up explaining why they had to kidnap Max. They explain what they're up to as they want to be free and don't want to destroy anything since they were made to do that. To prove to Max that they don't want to kill, Zeta ends up throwing their guns in the bin. Batman breaks in and starts to fight Zeta as Max tries to stop them both from fighting each other. The government men come in to stop Zeta after Zeta saved Batman from dying in the end of their fight. They fight back as Batman ends up taking Max and Zeta away. They hide in an abandoned train as Max attaches a disruptor to Zeta where Zeta explains everything we already knew and that they went to the school just to get the electronics to make the disruptor. Zeta ends up creating a completely unique disguise as Batman wants to make sure that they get out of town where Zeta ends up blowing the cover at a train station as they make a run for it. The men chase off the Zeta as Batman stops some of them from chasing Zeta. They take them out and as Zeta gets Bennett they're going to shoot him until he ends up destroying the gun and walking away. Bennett and some of the men start to fire at Zeta as they end up falling off the railing. And as Batman goes to get them when on the ground, Zeta disguises themselves to seem like that they're all broken, and then puts on a new disguise and runs away before the men catch up. The episode ends with Zeta going on the monorail and escaping Gotham as Batman flies away. I also like this episode more than I thought I would. I like the idea that a government weapon went rogue and wants to not be a weapon anymore and just wants to be free. It's actually an interesting story, but the weakest parts of the episode is Bennett and the government men going after Zeta. They're stereotypical government men, which it works for what it is, but it just isn't interesting. Also, why is Zeta's design completely different in this episode compared to what it ends up being in the show? It's honestly quite strange, but for some reason I kind of like this design more. Both designs aren't great anyway, but I prefer this one. The episode goes above splices but below the final cut. This episode starts with Terry, Dana and Chelsea at an airport as they're waiting for someone to arrive, as Nelson gets stopped when getting off. They find some random ooze in his bag as a guard takes it and gives it to some hooded man named Cobra One at the back. Nelson gets them as they're walking out of the airport. When they do, they see the stalker as he takes Nelson and asks for the ooze thing. Nelson tells him that he handed it into customs as he disappears after dropping him. Terry suits up the deal with the stalker as he explains himself. They fight for a bit until Bennett comes in and tells Batman exactly what's happening as stalkers working with them to hunt down Cobra before they release a deadly virus. Did we really need to see Bennett back? Also, they had to call it Cobra? G.I. Joe's gonna sue. But after explaining that, they're hunting down Cobra before they release the virus in Gotham City as it could wipe out everyone in the city. They're trying to find the leader named Falseface, who was the airport worker, as Bruce finds out that they might be at the Muscle City sweatshop, so they waste no time going there. 
They get in as they manage to get into the secret room, as they then see men putting hazmat suits on as Batman tries to sneak around. As he is, Stalker blows their cover by just jumping in to fight them. The Stalker manages to knock them all out as Batman gets shitty since they can't ask any of them to find out where False Face is. Luckily for them, they manage to find a disc that shows a floor plan for the Gotham Plastics building as they then make their move to get there before they do. As they're heading over there, we see False Face as he breaks in a security and lets some Cobra men in as Cobra 1 says that they're going to put the virus in the cred cards. Batman and Stalker get there as they fight them and they try to get the virus off them. They manage to type Cobra 1 as they get the virus where they interrogate him to find out what else he's up to. It reveals that False Face has also been infected with the virus as a plan B if their first plan didn't work, or if the government wouldn't comply with their demands. So they manage to chase down False Face as he ends up tasering Stalker as Batman keeps on chasing him. Batman ends up fighting False Face as False Face ends up lighting the place on fire. Eventually Batman ends up being stuck under a vent as the virus starts to affect him. He ends up running into the fire as Stalker comes out and saves Batman from burning to death as they escape the facility. They end up seeing False Face outside as he's nearly dead and the episode ends with Stalker saying that it wasn't his time to die. He will only die from his hands. Eh, it's alright. I don't really find this episode that interesting at all, besides from how Stalker and Batman have to work together. That's the best part of this episode. Everything else is just bland and forgettable, especially the Cobra Cult, which totally isn't Cobra from G.I. Joe. Some of the animation's cool, especially when False Face is being punched and his face is warping around, but there isn't really anything worth noting about this episode. Just forgettable. Goes above Terry's friend dates a robot, but below splices. April Moon starts with a few men as they seem to have robotic enhancements as they break into a jewelry store. They go for the vault as Batman shows up. He starts to fight them as Batman ends up getting knocked down after kicking their asses for a bit. They leave as the police arrive where one of them left something behind. We then see an old man as someone's banging on the door. We see that it's the group of four men as they barge their way in to get themselves fixed which was apparently not a part of their deal. Terry and Bruce look into the device as they find out that a doctor named Peter Corso creates these devices for people that have lost limbs. We see that Peter wants something else besides the jewels like S dollars the men leave. Batman then pays Peter a visit as he ends up knocking Batman out with an injection as he then wakes up the next morning as he's moved his lab elsewhere. Terry talks to Max about how he screwed up when she ends up ringing Peter. She lies to get him to come to them by saying that he needs to replace someone's leg since they were amputated. Peter arrives as Batman interrogates him where he reveals that he's helping the guys out just because they're going to kill his wife if they don't help him. His wife is April Moon as he then talks about how much she really means to him as he met her when she became his new nurse. Peter met one of them named Harold as he ended up wanting more than just his arm replaced as he wants to be enhanced. Later on he found out that Harold and his men kidnapped April and they said that they'll kill her if they don't do what they ask of him. Peter reveals that he put a failsafe in all of them and after he gets April he was going to use it on all of them to stop them from hurting people. They end up walking in as Batman has to fight them all. He gets tossed around for a bit until flying out the window as the four of them think that the city's there since Batman flew away. They leave as Batman ends up following them as they figure out that the failsafe is voice activated and that it'll be a phrase that only Peter would say. Batman sees them as Peter's approaching knowing that Batman wouldn't just leave and that he doesn't want Batman trying to stop them as he doesn't want April hurt. As he's talking about it, April comes out as she seems to be cheating on Peter with Harold. Peter starts to cry as Harold and his men see them and starts to fight Batman. He ends up saying April Moon to one of the men as it seems to work and completely deactivates their upgrades so Batman then says it to them all. He gets through three of them but Harold gets away as Terry tells Bruce about what happened as the episode ends with Peter putting Harold to sleep as he turns on a drill. I like the episode quite a lot. I think it has a good balance of being serious when it needs to be and being not so serious when it wants to be. The whole arc of April ending up cheating on Peter is some serious stuff but there's also some other things in the episode such as the way that they beat the bad guys which is honestly kind of goofy. It was actually a surprising twist that April was cheating on Peter but honestly the worst part about this episode is Harold and his other men. They just aren't interesting in the slightest. Goes in between Zeta and Final Cut. The longest episode title yet. We're gonna have to see if it's any good. It starts with some alien planets. We see that it's some kind of video game since Terry and Max are in the game fighting against ships. They end up destroying the ships and we see that the game's called the same name of the episode. The guy playing with them named Corey got the best squad out of anyone in the game as Corey accidentally knocked into Nelson where he ended up walking away. Someone dressed up like the video game character is watching over Corey and back at school, Corey gets an email from the creator of the game as he invites Corey to his place. Corey goes as he then sees a few other people in his place with a bunch of replicas of ships in the game. Mr. Harper walks out and talks to these guys as he welcomes them to the Sanctum of Sentries. The three of them have the highest scores in Gotham as he shows that they can actually become real Sentries. We then see Batman as he goes to the Hall of Records where he sees that Sentries are trying to steal things as Batman goes in to stop them. The Sentries manage to get away after making gas leak as the building's blowing up, Batman manages to escape. Terry tells Max about what he saw as she mentions that Corey might possibly be one of the sentries. They try to talk to him before he leaves but Corey just gives him no response. 
Batman then night sneaks into Mr. Harper's place as he knows that Corey's hiding something since he would definitely talk about all the replicas and stuff in Mr. Harper's house. Batman has to fight some drones that come out and then he runs into Mr. Harper. Batman confronts him about the sentries breaking into the Hall of Records where he says he has no idea about it. Batman leaves but he leaves a microphone in his place as Mr. Harper tells the sentries about a dark one named Alden Michaels. As he tells his sentries that sentries of the last cosmos is in the game but they use the game to recruit the new sentries. This episode is literally just the movie The Last Starfighter. The only difference is that the recruiter is the villain. So Batman goes to find Elden as he ends up getting shot by him. Elden keeps shooting until Batman knocks the gun out of his hands, but we find out that Elden is voiced by Patton Oswalt, as he explains that Mr. Harper stole his ideas from him. Sentries come in to fight them as they end up taking Elden, and Batman manages to have the file that proves that it was all Elden's ID. The sentries bring Elden to Mr. Harper as he electrocutes Elden for trying to take him to court. Batman comes in as he proves to a few sentries that Elden actually worked on the game and created the idea for it as Simon took the profits. Batman ends up beating Simon as we then see Bruce talking to Terry as he's fiddling with one of the swords. The episode ends as we see Elden with the three centuries give Elden the original script as they want some answers for story related things as they call him the wise one, so Elden ends up explaining everything to them. This episode's okay. Besides from it being a copy of The Last Starfighter, there are some pretty neat things such as the villain actually being the one that stole the idea for the game and took all the profits for his own benefit. I really don't have much else to say since the episode's honestly quite forgettable as well. It goes above Joyride but below Armory. Payback starts with the guy named Drew leaving his workplace as his boss named Warren asks him to work overtime. He ends up doing so as some figure comes in named Payback and goes after Warren as he tells Drew to stay where he is and that he'll be safe. Payback attacks Warren for how he treats his workers as Batman comes in to stop him but he ends up getting away. Terry goes to the Batcave as they try to find a connection to potentially find out who Payback is but only found out that two kids that got attacked by Payback are connected to a youth center. We see Terry as he goes to the Gotham Youth Cancelling Center where he talks to Dr. Stan as he takes him around the place. Stan introduces Terry to his son and this guy named Howard, as Stan has some kind of emergency where Terry ends up connecting the back computer to his as he's transferring the files but he gets knocked out. He wakes up to see Howard and Stan as Stan seems to be a little suspicious about Terry. After that Terry's with Bruce at the Batcave as Terry knows that Howard would possibly be payback. So Terry suits up and finds the weapon of paybacks as Howard attacks him. They fight for a bit as he then finds out that Howard isn't payback as paybacks attacking a family on the news. Batman goes in to stop him as they're attacking a couple in their car, but Batman manages to save them just before they crash into the water below. Batman goes off to Payback as they fight in the woods. After fighting for a little bit, the woods start to light up as Batman has to stop the fire where Payback gets away. Back at the Batcave, Bruce gets shitty at Terry for just going with his gut instinct since he attacked an innocent man, and that from now on Terry's doing things his way. Terry ends up going to the youth center as everyone else says that he should confront Bruce, as later we then see Terry take Bruce to a party. At the party, Payback goes off to Bruce in the elevator, where Batman comes in to save him as the elevator is about to fall. Batman's about to fight Payback, but the dumbass knocks down a support beam and Batman has to save him as he's falling. Batman then finds out that Payback is Stan's son in a robot suit, as Stan blames himself for how his son ended up since he didn't give his son enough time. The episode ends as Terry says that he screwed up twice, as Bruce tells him to learn from it, and then inquires about what Terry said to make his son so mad at Bruce. I surprisingly enjoyed this episode more than I thought I would. I do have one main gripe though, and it's that Payback could have been a much cooler and more menacing villain. The design of the character is cool, but there just needed to be a bit more to make you believe that it could actually really take out Batman at any time. I think that's what would have made the character work, but besides from that, it's solid overall. I'm glad that they didn't go for the predictable approach where Payback was Howard, since he was the most likely suspect. This episode goes above Final Cut, but below the Egg Baby. Well, where is Terry? Why don't we find out as the episode starts with Terry, Dana, Howard and Max as they leave the movies. Terry ends up leaving after kissing Dana as he then goes on the train. He sees some suspicious person in a trench coat as he follows him. Terry ends up seeing him as he hops onto the tracks and he goes to follow. The next day Terry seems to be gone as his mum and Matt don't see him at home and he doesn't even shop to school as Dana and Max talk about it. Even Bruce is trying to contact Terry but with no luck as he drives to go talk to Max as she tells him where she last saw Terry. Max ends up following along as we then see that Terry's actually stuck under some rubble in his bat suit as some kid talks to him to help him out. We then see that the person in the trench coat is Shriek's sidekick Donnie as Shriek suits up. He confirms that he was the one that knocked the rubble over as he then tries to hit him again with the rubble falling on them. Batman and the kid escape the falling rubble as he tries to contact Bruce but with no luck as they're so far underground. Bruce and Max see Terry's bag on a thug which is a part of the T-Gang as Bruce follows them. He ends up knocking at their door where Bruce says that you'll pay a fair price for the bag and as he's going to pay for it, they jump Bruce. Batman's still with the kid named Dak, as he says that he wishes that he was someone like Spellbinder. 
But they end up finding a way out as there's still some rubble on the roof and they end up making a small hole. Only Dak can fit through, so Batman sends him through to hopefully help Batman, but Shriek finds Dak. We then go back to Bruce as Max manages to spray two in the eyes, as Bruce gets up and hits the rest of them as he manages to find out where he got the bag after interrogating one of them. Shriek tries to find out where Batman is by trying to persuade Dak to tell him where he is, but with no luck. But as Bruce and Max are trying to find Terry, Bruce baits Max into distracting the workers where Bruce can sneak past them. Dak ends up showing them where Batman is as Shriek knocks the wall down, but it's actually a wall that connects to the river as the place starts to flood. Batman gets out and ends up saving Dak after he's about to fall to his death, where Shriek confronts him, but Bruce manages to knock Shriek down. They get handed into the place as the episode ends with Terry going home after talking to Bruce, where he has to get ready for school as he's about to go to bed and sleep. I don't know, I really just wasn't a fan of this episode. I kind of wish that this was an actual mystery to where Terry went, that he was gone for longer than a day or two. It would have been really interesting if he was actually gone for a good while, even to the point where the authorities are involved, it would have been really good. But no, this episode's honestly quite small in scale and honestly really forgettable. Not the worst episode, but it goes above Centuries of the Last Cosmos, but below Armory. Ace in the Hole starts with Terry walking Ace as Bruce goes into a building. Ace ends up seeing someone running away as Ace goes after them. Terry tries to stop Ace as a man pulls a gun on Ace where Ace bites them. Eventually the man gets in a way in a car as Bruce and Terry try to find out why Ace went after this man, as Ace is still missing. They search on the back computer to find out who the man he chased after was, as they find out that it's a guy named Ronnie Boxer. They find out that Ronnie Boxer is a man that's a part of illegal dog sports. As Terry leaves after talking to Bruce, we go to a flashback as we see Ronnie pick up Ace from the pound as a pup, where he got raised to be a fighter where Ronnie abuses Ace. We see Ace being put into a fight as police raid the fight and try to take the dogs, but Ace runs out into the snow as Bruce has gone to visit Crime Alley. Bruce runs into Ace as he puts flowers down where his parents were murdered, as Ace jumps onto a clown that tries to jump Bruce. Bruce ends up taking Ace in as he seems hurt, as we come back to see Bruce say that he won't let anyone hurt him again. We see Ace on the run as someone's trying to take them into the pound, to where we see Terry undercover as he gets a number that would be a potential lead. Ace sniffs something and knows that Terry's around, as the guy that's working for the pound manages to get Ace and put him to sleep. Batman goes to look around Ronnie's place as Ronnie ends up coming out to try and shoot Batman, to where he manages to accidentally blow the place up. Batman stops the fire by knocking a water tower down onto the building as Ronnie gets away. We see Ronnie as he runs into the man working for the pound, as he recognises that it's Ace and that he might actually have a use for him. Bruce finds out where tonight's fight is as Batman sneaks his way in. He ends up walking into a trap as Ronnie has Batman on the stage, to where he releases a mutant dog on him. Batman ends up tying the dog up as Ace escapes and chases after Ronnie, and throws him overboard as the dog escapes and Ace comes back to help Batman. They end up knocking the dog out as we see Ronnie hanging off the end of the boat by a thread, as Ace and Terry return to Wayne Mansion. What a great episode to finish the season off on. I'm glad that we got this backstory for Ace as it makes you really feel for Ace and actually explains to how he's useful to both Bruce and Batman. I like this episode a lot as it makes a silly character like Ace the Bathound into a character that you actually care about, and that's really hard to do. Goes above hooked up but below sneak peek. The season is honestly mixed, but it's still good overall. You go from having the worst episodes so far in the series such as Rats and Joyride, on the other hand you also have the best episodes in the whole series such as Sneak Peek and Eyewitness. Before watching this season again, I saw a lot of people saying that season 2 is much weaker than season 1, but after I've watched it again, I don't really think that's the case. But there are definitely some interesting episodes such as The Egg Baby and Hidden Agenda that I quite like a lot. I was also surprised that only one episode of this season was affected by the Columbine effect, since this season dropped right around the time where everything was being affected by it, so it's honestly good that this show was barely affected by it. Season 1 is noticeably darker overall, but you still have some really dark moments in this season, but you have some episodes in this season that are a lot lighter in tone, and that isn't particularly a bad thing. I'm still really enjoying this show, and Season 2 was a slam dunk, so I gotta see how this show finishes off with its final season. We're gonna start off with... We start Season 3 with the museum as the Royal Flush Gang are breaking in without 10. They accidentally set off the alarm as they manage to run into Batman where they end up fighting. In the fight we get to see that Ace is potentially a robot as his robot arm is exposed as they end up taking the statue and making a run for it. Batman chases after them as the police arrive where Batman knocks Jack out. He gets taken into police custody where Barbara interrogates him whilst Batman's listening in, asking who they work for as they say they aren't working for anybody, but both Barbara and Batman know that isn't true. We see King as he talks to Paxton Powers. God, that's someone we haven't seen in a long time. But King gives Paxton the Jaguar that they stole. 
Paxton doesn't accept it since it was damaged in their encounter with Batman, as King gets shitty. Eventually, Paxton's assistant or partner named Miss Thorpe attacks them as she manages to knock him down. Paxton still gives him some money as they end up leaving, but we then see the Royal Flush Gang are hiding out in an abandoned casino. After that, we see Paxton as the Royal Flush Gang attack him and manage to tie Paxton up. As he's tied up, he says that he will give him anything they want. After Batman tries to talk to Melanie, we then see Paxton tied up in the Royal Flush Gang's hideout as they're demanding 20 million, but he can't give it to them as his money's tied up in investments. They ring Bruce as he says no to giving them 20 million, as the policy they agreed on denies them from giving terrorists 20 million dollars. As King's about to kill Paxton, he says that he has a crown that's worth twice what they're asking, as King rings Bruce again to make him go get it for him. Terry and Bruce go get the crown from Paxton's office as they notice the Jagger in there as well, as they take the crown. But as King lets Paxton free, he doesn't seem too happy about it since Bruce will expose him for his ties to the gang. Paxton ends up proposing a deal to the gang to kill Wayne, as we then see Bruce getting ready to give the crown to the gang, as Batman's watching from afar, but Ace sneaks up behind him. They fight, but eventually Batman comes in and destroys Ace by throwing him in the water, and ends up cuffing the Queen as King gets away with the crown. Back at the hideout, we see that King was actually hooking up with Miss Thorpe, as Queen manages to come in and fights King, as Mrs. Thorpe makes a run for it, but Batman stops her. Then goes in to stop both King and Queen, as we then see Jack being bailed out of prison, as Melanie gets him out, and offers him a job at the restaurant she works at. We then see Paxton being taken into prison, as Melanie and Jack leave. Yeah, these Royal Flush Gang episodes are alright. They're never that interesting, but they aren't that bad either. It's actually good to see that Melanie's turned her life around, and she tries to make Jack turn his life around as well. Besides that, the rest of the episode is just average. Nothing too special to it, since in my opinion the only interesting Royal Flush Gang member was Ten. But since she isn't in the gang anymore, it's just not interesting. Yo, I would be happy if it was just Korn's 2002 album, Untouchables. But no, this episode starts as some person with some kind of electrical power breaks into some kind of facility where no one's even able to touch him because of his electrical field. Batman tries to stop him but gets his ass handed to him as he manages to steal a vial from a boiling hot liquid to where Batman tries to stop him but has no luck at all as he accidentally knocks a billboard down. Back at the Batcave, Bruce tells us that the vial is something called Beta Sterellium which is the only one to exist and it's very unstable and that's why it's stored in boiling hot water. The next day, Bruce and Terry go to Wayne Powell's research facility as a scientist named Dr. Suzuki shows off a belt that does the same kind of effects that we saw from the person that stole the vial. Bruce ends up seeing the files after asking Dr. Suzuki, as Dr. Blades tells him that no one's allowed to have access to them besides the people in the facility. Bruce then tells Dr. Blade that the belt could be a weapon if the overload problems were addressed. Dr. Blades basically tells him to get lost as he ends up leaving. We then go to these two people as the same person at the start comes out of the hot water as he gives them the vial and he gets paid for the job. They then explain that they need a gamma isotope, as he tells them that he'll go and get it and if he sees the bat he'll kill him. After that, Terry talks to Dana as she gets shitty at Terry for talking about the girl named Irene that had the belt on since she lived in the facility her whole life. That's one thing I've never understood about this show is that Dana hasn't even been loyal herself. So like, she's one to talk. Irene ends up ringing Terry as Dana ends up leaving, saying that she's lost and that she escaped from the facility, as they end up meeting on the beach. They seem to hit it off a bit as she then has to run back to the lab since she only has 20 minutes of power left as they run into Dr. Blades. He gets annoyed as he bans Terry from the facility and he tells her that she can't use the belt again. At the Batcave, Bruce shows that another isotope was stolen, as they figure out that the two isotopes with another isotope can make a very dangerous bomb, as they have to stop the person from getting the third isotope. Irene ends up ringing Terry's place as Matt answers to hear her say that she wants to meet Terry on the beach as they can get more of the iso rings, but Batman's busy trying to stop the person from stealing another isotope. They fight for a bit as he then manages to throw Batman off a cliff and throw some rubble on top of him. He manages to escape as Batman manages to get out, as we then see Irene and she's trying to get access to a belt as the person stealing the isotopes walk in. We see that the person is Dr. Suzuki under the suit as he attacks Irene and Dr. Blades, whilst Bruce and Batman find out that it could be one of the doctors at the facility. Dr. Suzuki attacks Dr. Blades, and then Irene as Batman comes in to stop them. They fight for a while, but eventually Batman activates the turbines in the room, as he then manages to knock out Dr. Suzuki with the turbines, as the belt turns off and he's able to save him just before he gets crushed. The episode ends with Terry talking to Irene as she already reveals that she has a spouse named Larry, as they end up going on a roller coaster together as Terry leaves with Bruce. This honestly could have been a lot better. I think it would have been a bit better if they showed more of Irene and how she's been isolated her whole life. The stuff was honestly the most interesting part of the whole episode. I think the twist that Dr. Suzuki was the bad guy was pretty obvious, but I wish the villain was more of a threat. Also, what happened with the whole isotopes thing? It seems like they ditched that whole plot point halfway through the episode just to focus on taking down Dr. Suzuki, which honestly kind of sucks. He could have became a massive threat if they actually got all three isotopes when we see him try to use it against Gotham. I think that would have been great, but this episode does go above the last one.
Inkling starts at a space center as they're launching a rocket where Ink comes in and starts destroying it as Batman comes in to stop her. They fight for a while until she manages to make the ship fall over and gets away as the rocket starts to activate. The rocket causes a lot of damage to the facility until it blows up. Bruce is out on a business trip so Terry talks to Max to try and find out who potentially hired Ink, where we then see her go to a man named Winchell, the CEO of a company called Shimano Industries. Ink goes to get paid for her work as Winchell turns on Ink as she manages to get away after getting shot with some kind of gun that weakens her powers. We then see some girl named Deanna as her car's about to get impounded where she ends up paying for her car to not get impounded. She goes back inside as Ink approaches her. She shits herself as Ink asks for her help, saying that she's her mother. She ends up explaining that she had to leave her at birth as she was really young when she had her and that she was on the run. After seeing Terry talk to Max about how Ink may have been at Shimano Industries and that Winchell might have hired her, we then see Ink as she's resting. Ink tries to get Deanna to steal mutagen for her as she ends up convincing her to do so as they come up with a plan to do it. We go to Batman as he investigates Winchell's place and finds out that Ink was there as Winchell walks in and Batman interrogates him. He ends up pressing a button that brings guards in as he manages to take them down. When he does, he chases after Winchell as he pulls the gun out that weakened Ink. Batman knocks him out then holds him over a building to get information about Ink's whereabouts after Max looks into her bank transfers. She finds out that she's been transferring to Deanna Clay as we then see Batman get Ink as Deanna gets back with the mutagen. Ink ends up using it as she manages to toss Batman around for a bit until she starts to bubble up and melt as she's about to kill Batman. Deanna double crossed her by messing with the mutagen so she can get all of her money as Ink completely dissolves and melts away. The episode ends with Batman talking to Deanna as he thinks that Ink will probably come back as she seems to be scared for her safety but Ink seems to be in the shadows. Yeah, I like this episode quite a bit. It's definitely nothing amazing but I feel like every episode we've had with Ink is solid. It just seems weird to randomly bring in a character that's Ink's daughter in the third episode she appears in but I actually like the twist where Deanna double crossed Ink and especially the end where Batman tells her that she could come back. Honestly, it goes at the top for the season. We start this episode off with a delivery van going to Wayne Powers as the truck passes by as it manages to grab the van and pull it into the truck. When inside, the driver comes out with a gun as they rob the van and throw the people inside out of their truck as Batman goes in to stop the truck. Batman ends up fighting them until some radioactive waste starts to spill as they then release the trailer on the truck as the two of them get away. Bruce then explains what the chemical is, as it's a plant growth hormone named serostone and it could potentially make farming much easier, but as Terry's on the phone, some guy's being a bit too touchy with Dana. Terry pulls him out and then recognizes him as Big Time, but his name is Charlie, where he calls Terry TT since they apparently used to be friends or something, as they walk off together and talk to each other since Big Time has been locked up until recently. Charlie tells Terry he has something lined up with some big people, but Terry says no since he has a life now and that he shouldn't do it either since he just got out. He asks who would hire him since he wants to go straight, but Terry thinks that he could potentially get him a job under Wayne Powers, and he ends up persuading Bruce to give him a job. As Terry tells Charlie about this, we then see one of the guys in the truck as he seems to be using Terry to get into Wayne Powers to get to the chemical, as we then see him work in the overnight shift. He retrieves the disc after getting a worker, which ends up being the captain to help him get it since they had to move something. Back at the Batcave, Bruce is still looking into Charlie, as he has connections with one of the people we saw at his place named Richie, as he's telling Terry that he needs to keep his eyes open since he's suspicious about Charlie. They end up finding out that Charlie's probably going to help criminals with attacking Wayne Powers as we see Richie and Karos create a glove of the captain's handprint as Charlie's going to break in and steal some agrochem for them. Terry ends up talking to Charlie as he leaves their building saying that he knows what Charlie's planning as Charlie tells Terry that this will be his big break but Charlie ends up getting away as Terry puts a tracker on his briefcase. That night we see Charlie breaking into Wayne Powers as he gets to the agrochem and lets Karos and two other men in as they're taking barrels full of it until Batman comes in to stop them. They start shooting at him as they end up fighting, but as Charlie grabs a barrel, he gets chemicals all over him as he just brushes it off and grabs another one. Carol ends up getting Batman stuck under a massive pile of sand as they get away, but at their hideout, Charlie gets the blame for Batman stopping their plans. We then see Terry at school as Charlie's waiting for him as Terry talks to him. He explains that he needs to pay them off since they said Charlie needs to pay them for his stuff up as he then ends up in pain and runs away. That night, Terry ends up explaining what happened to them as Max Terry got 90 days of juvie, but Charlie got 3 years of prison but Terry feels bad about how if he doesn't help him, he'll die. Batman ends up recording what the two guys are saying as they admit to what they did, but Charlie comes in all mutated and kicks the shit out of Batman and Karos as he grabs Richie ready to throw him off the building. Batman comes back as he fights Charlie and Karos, and at the same time, Karos accidentally makes himself fall off as Batman ends up beating Charlie. The episode ends with Terry talking to Dana and Max, as she tells him that he's glad that Terry didn't end up getting mixed into Charlie's stuff. Yeah, this episode's solid. I do like the dynamic that Charlie and Terry have, and it's interesting that we get to see someone that was involved with Terry's life before he ended up changing it for the better, as they're still the same person as they were before. The rest of the episode's alright, but it's really just their dynamic that makes it better than what the rest of the episode actually is, since side characters like Karos or Richie aren't interesting in the slightest. 
goes above untouchable but below inkling. Oh yeah. I'm excited to watch this episode again. So it starts with a musical about Batman, and honestly, what a weird way to start the episode, but I kind of like it. As we see Bruce and Terry watching the theater show as it's Bruce's birthday. Bruce hates it as he ends up leaving during the show to go back to the Batcave, as he looks at photos of his previous flings, such as Zatanna, Lois Lane, Selena Kyle, and even Barbara. The one thing that I will always hate is shipping Barbara with Bruce. It's like getting with your teacher, that shit's weird. As he's doing that, Talia al Ghul comes in and says happy birthday, and gives him food and tells Bruce that he can use the Lazarus Pit. Terry goes back as Bruce introduces Terry to Talia, as they both seem to know a bit about each other, and apparently Talia helped Bruce back in 2009 to have one last fight against Raish. Talia then tells Bruce to consider it, as he has until tomorrow night to accept it, or not, as Terry ends up discussing it with Max, as he knows that Bruce would want to be Batman again, but it's not worth the risk. Bruce ends up going after he failed to save a woman from unkind traffic, and being thrown onto the road by some thugs, but Batman came in to save them both. Bruce sees Talia, as she ends up persuading Bruce to go to the Lazarus Pit, as Terry goes with him on Talia's private plane. They end up in Cuba, where a residence is, as Bruce is preparing to go into the Lazarus Pit, as he ends up being dipped into the pit, and when he gets out, he looks at least 20 years younger, but seems to be going crazy as Talia makes him go to sleep as he's about to punch Terry. Bruce wakes up to see himself in the mirror as he then goes to test his strength as he seems to be much stronger, but he gets pissed and says that it's a cheat, and that if he stays here, he'll end up weaker than ever. They try to leave as a few of Talia's men try to stop them, as they manage to kick the shit out of them, and then end up finding Talia, as she reveals herself to be Raish and Talia's body, where the two get knocked out. Two guards go to throw Terry into alligator-infested waters as he wakes up and takes them out, as he then goes back for Bruce. Speaking about him, we see that Raish used Talia's body as a sacrifice so he could take over her body in their last encounter, since his body was too weak, and now Raish wants to put his conscience into Bruce's body, since he has a peak human physique. All of the guards are after Terry as he manages to sneak in and take out the main guard with his bat suit, as Raish starts to transfer, but Batman comes in to stop Raish. They fight Batman until he manages to knock Raish out after a sword hits an electronic device, as the place lights up on fire. Bruce and Batman try to leave a Raish, but they go back for the computer as the place blows up, with Raish inside, as the episode then ends with Bruce looking over photos with him and Talia, as he tells her to rest well. Yeah, this episode kicks ass. Such a good idea to look into what Bruce would do if he was offered to be young again, after not being Batman for 20 years, and that he actually went to use the pit is a surprise, but it's believable. Then after using it, Bruce rejecting it makes a lot of sense, but the twist here that Talia is Raish is honestly quite disturbing, since he basically killed her just to take over her body. It's the character stuff like this that happens with Bruce that's just so good and makes for a great episode. Goes for the top of this season without a doubt. Speak No Evil starts with someone in an alleyway as they're being chased down by two guys, but we see that it's actually a gorilla. We then see Terry, Dana, Max and Howard as they hear the same girl screaming whilst at a museum, so Terry manages to use an excuse to go suit up and deal with the gorilla as he then has to chase it down. The gorilla ends up getting away in the train as two zoologists were also trying to chase them as they call out its name, which is Fingers. They explain to Batman that they're looking after Fingers. Batman then ends up looking through the zoology lab to find a vial of chemicals that may help, but the two zoologists walk in as he finds it. He goes invisible and hears them talking as he interrupts them by saying what they're doing is illegal since the chemical they were using is illegal. They were using it on the gorilla to make it smarter as it seems to be getting smarter and smarter by the minute. Fingers is still running around the city, even passing by the zoo, as Batman then catches up to Fingers as it climbs some scaffolding. Batman tries to get Fingers, but it starts to talk as it doesn't want to go back into a cage, as it explains that their mother got taken because of someone named Van Dyle, an animal poacher that took her and her babies as they were separated from there. Batman says they will try and stop him, but Fingers only just wants to find his mother, as he ends up agreeing to Batman's terms but gives him until dawn to find Van Dyle, and have him behind bars, otherwise he'll go to Van Dyle's animal conservation facility himself. Batman ends up going there as he sees that half the animals are chained up, as Batman finds out that they've been putting radio transmitters in the animals. As Batman's snooping around, Van Dyle sees Batman and tases him as he gets the evidence from him. While that's happening, we see fingers as they move around the city as he then manages to catch a cab because the driver thinks he's in a suit apparently. We see that Van Dyle threw Batman in with the lions as they're watching him struggle with them as fingers manages to come in and save Batman. They fight Van Dyle and his goons for a while until Barbara manages to come in and tell Van Dyle about the call they got about the transmitters they use, as Fingers tells his start of the story. He makes a run for it, but Fingers slaps him around and asks him for his mother, as he doesn't know where she is. Fingers is about to kill him as Batman manages to convince him to stop, as the episode then ends with Fingers being let free into the wild, as Bruce and Terry are there with him, as they were going to make him back to normal. Fingers says no to it as he wants to still be as smart as a human to potentially stop poachers from coming in the future. You know what? I was surprised that I really enjoyed this episode since I thought it was just going to be really silly. It's a bit silly to start with a wild gorilla running around Gotham, but it surprisingly gets a little serious with the whole plot point of Van Gyle poaching animals from the wild. It works for this episode, and that stuff makes the episode better in my opinion. 
I will say though, Van Gogh is just a typical evil person that takes animals for their own benefit, but the episode's still very solid overall, so it goes above King's Ransom but below Untouchable. Alright, I'm extremely keen to watch this awesome two-part. It starts in Metropolis as we see a family looking at the Justice League Watchtower, as we see one of the members named Micron, who's the Adam's successor, training inside. They end up beating the robot, and damn, their lips look fucked up. An alarm gets set off as they see that a monorail's gone haywire, and just keeps speeding up as Micron goes in to save them, as they end up saving the driver and makes the monorail go off track, as they seem to be badly wounded. We go back to Gotham as Batman's chasing after Ink in a ship, as someone looking suspicious is watching from afar. So the ending and Inkling actually happened where she was in the shadows of her daughter's place? Always just thought that was a representation of her daughter's fears. But, apparently not. Ink crashes as Batman approaches her on foot as they fight, and eventually the suspicious looking person comes out as Ink wraps around them. They end up spinning Ink off as they reveal that they're Superman as they stop Ink. They then go to the Batcave as Bruce talks to Clark, and Superman sounds different. In this, he's voiced by Christopher McDonald instead of Tim Daly, but he did voice Jor-El and Estaz, and Kent Mansley, the villain in The Iron Giant. Also, he's Shooter McGavin from Happy Gilmore. But Clark says that he wants Batman to join the Justice League as he's proved himself to be a worthy member of the Justice League. They go to the Watchtower as the rest of the members aren't too happy about Batman joining the League. Superman takes Batman and Micron to see that he's in bad shape, but he's healing as he thinks that someone deliberately caused Micron to get hurt the way he did. Superman wants Batman to spy on them as he isn't sure that one of them might be behind Micron's injuries as Batman looks through their files. Aqua Girl approaches Batman and she tells him to give it time as everyone's been on edge since Micron got injured. Batman has the cameras up to all the members' rooms after Aqua Girl leaves, and when she goes in her room after swimming for a little bit, the camera feed cuts as Batman goes to her room. She ends up passing out as Batman manages to get Aqua Girl out by stealing Big Barter's weapon and shooting the wall. Barter and Warhawk crack the shits at Batman as they didn't contact him over the intercom, but instead took action as they end up leaving. Later that day, Batman and Superman have a look at the tank. Batman finds out that one of the chips are fried, as Superman thinks for certain that there's a traitor in their league. We then see the league as they go save a bunch of people in the city, as the whole city seems to be under attack as they split up and deal with different things, such as a ship sinking and buildings collapsing. Batman ends up coming in as Superman tells him to help Warhawk with saving people. Warhawk heard a call in their frequency, but no one else heard it as he goes for it, but since Superman told Batman to stay with him, Batman decides to follow. Warhawk ends up stopping a missile, but it ends up blowing up Warhawk as Batman gets blamed for it, where Bruce and Terry decide to look over the explosion. They notice that someone made it blow up, as that someone is Superman, as Bruce gives Terry a piece of kryptonite to stop him, and that's how the first part ends. How cool is that? I love this episode. It's honestly believable that Terry would be accepted into the League, but for the twist to be that Superman was the one trying to kill off the League members is actually really well done. I think you start to notice that something odd's going on with one of the members when Aqua Girl's attacked as the chip was fried since Superman could have done that. The only real gripe I have is that we need to get to know the members of the Justice League since you don't really care about them at all because they're just CT versions of their counterparts. Goes at the top though. Yeah, straight into the second part, as it starts with Batman showing all the news that he found out to the rest of the League, as Barter doesn't believe it and believes that he possibly fabricated it. Barter tries to throw hands with Batman after he calls her pig-headed for not thinking straight, as Green Lantern stops her, but Warhawk walks in telling him to calm down. He explains that he remote controlled his armor to deal with the rocket, as he seems suspicious that only he got the call about the rocket. But Warhawk seems to be happy about what Batman did as they're going to go and try and interrogate Superman. Speaking about him, we see him fiddle with Micron's life support as they end up talking to Superman, but he starts to believe that all of them were traitors against him. As Aqua Girl approaches him after Barter does, we see that something's moving around his chest as he starts to attack, and fuck yeah, his ass is being controlled by Starro. Micron ends up getting out to help them as Batman tries to get his kryptonite after dropping it. Micron gets knocked out as Batman gets the kryptonite as Superman gets knocked out of the building. He leaves as the members talk about how Superman possibly went to the Fortress of Solitude, as hopefully Bruce knows where it is since none of the League members know where it is. They end up using a boom tube to arrive in the Fortress, and after looking for Superman, they end up having to fight robot versions of Superman. They end up running into the real one as Batman knocks him out with the kryptonite, as they see Starro wrapped around his chest. Aquagirl ends up finding out what Starro is after touching it, since it ended up leaving its planet, but not by choice, as it was adopted from its planet, and ayo, hey, this connects to Superman the Animated Series? But it ended up escaping after Superman took Star into the fortress by using Superman to escape, and it's been on him for years as he wants to take over the whole planet, as they then find a shit ton of Starros in the fortress. They end up attaching themselves to the League members besides Batman as he then makes a run for it. Superman chases after him as Batman tells Bruce about what happened, and honestly, this shot of Superman going after Batman is so goofy. Just looks like a PNG growing in size, but Superman takes out the Batmobile as Batman then manages to get Starro off Superman by electrocuting it. Superman and Batman then go after the rest of the League members as they manage to get the Starros off of them, 
and block the Staros off from escaping the fortress after saving Aquagirl. The episode then ends as they send Staros back to their planets, as all of them ask if Batman wants to be a part of the League, as they say it will be a one-off from the original Batman since he was part-time. Batman then says that maybe he has something in common with him after all. This episode is even better. Bringing Star into all this makes a lot of sense as to why Superman was doing what he was in the first part, and it's also great seeing this episode connect back to Superman the Animated Series where we saw Star and the main man two-parter. Seeing Star come back after all this time is satisfying, and I'm glad that he ended up becoming a villain in one of the DCAU shows. This episode is just a great way to finish off the two-parter, and honestly, I think this part's just a little bit better than the first part. It goes at the top. The trail starts with the two men in a van, as a truck has completely blocked the road ahead of them. One of them gets out with a gun to go look at it, as Charlie attacks him and gets out. He then grabs the van as the guy inside tries to drive off, as Batman goes in to stop him. Charlie grabs a bag off them as the police arrive, where he manages to take the police out as Batman comes in to stop him. As Batman has Charlie restrained, someone hijacks the police vehicle and shoots Batman then picks up Charlie as they escape. After Terry talks to Bruce at the Batcave, we see Charlie with his accomplice named Major at his hotel, as Charlie seems to be a little annoyed about him just being the muscle. Terry tells Max about how he had a run-in with Charlie, as men jump Terry and end up taking him in a car, as Max ends up ringing Bruce and tells him that Terry got abducted, but Max has his suit, so Bruce is going to pick it up as soon as possible. Terry then gets his blindfold taken off, where he sees Charlie. Terry's reasonably pissed off about being kidnapped, but Charlie tries to make Terry his new partner. Terry obviously says no as Charlie gets shitty, but he just starts breaking stuff until Major walks in. He ends up getting angry with Major as Terry tries to escape the building, where his men notice and chase after him. Major tells Charlie to end him, or Charlie and his business is finished, so as Terry's making a run for it, hopping onto a truck, Charlie chases after him. Eventually, Charlie gets him as he can't kill Terry. Terry tells Charlie that he just needs to go to the police, and even though he'll be in jail, they'll have doctors that will work on a cure for him. They end up compromising with him, saying that if he gets Majors first, he will stay and wait where they are at the moment, and then hand himself in after he's dealt with. So as Majors is leaving the hotel, police surround them as Majors and his men try to shoot their way out of it, as Majors tries to crawl away, but Barbara stops him. After taking them in, Terry and Barbara go to find Charlie, where he was, but he isn't there. But Terry runs into him as he says that he was never going to hand himself in to the police. He only did what he said to get Majors off of him, and that Terry could easily join him now, but he lied about wanting to be cured, and that he didn't have it in him to kill Terry. So Bruce comes in and hits Charlie with his car, as he gives Terry his backpack as he suits up and takes down Charlie. He ends up doing so after he accidentally falls off the bridge, as the episode ends with Bruce saying that he knows how it feels to go up against a friend. Did we really need to see another episode with Charlie? I personally don't think so, but this episode's alright. It just didn't really interest me that much at all, and the twist that Charlie was playing Terry to make him do what he wants is pretty predictable. I really don't have much to say about this episode. It was just quite forgettable. It goes above King's Ransom, but below Speak No Evil. Cobra's back? Really? And this time it's a two-parter as well. Hey. Anywho, the episode starts with the delivery of isotopes, but the person in the truck seems to be a part of Cobra with a tattoo on the back of his hand. Cobra 1 and two other goons are in the truck as they go in and take the thermal bomb, but Batman comes in to stop them. The driver whips out some electrical nunchucks and knocks Batman down as they escape. Terry's really doubting himself back at the Batcave as Bruce recommends an old friend of his as she owns a fish market. Terry mentions that Bruce sent him as she takes him out the back to a dojo as two men fight Terry and knock him down. She comes back out as their sensei saying that he lacks discipline. She then introduces herself as Kari Tanaga, and that she studied with Bruce under the same sensei, and shows Terry around the dojo as Terry wants to be taught her ways. She ends up teaching him about balance, but he goes to get some air as three of the students go out into a car looking suspicious. Terry tells Bruce about this, as a man accidentally runs into him as two Cobra goons are shooting at him. They end up getting a man and put him to sleep as they steal a vial from him. So back at the Batcave, they find out who the person was, and that they worked at a natural history museum, so Terry and Max go there. They walk around the museum as they then sneak into a closed off display as Max distracts one of the workers there as Terry sneaks into Punjari's office. It was researching DNA and now they're trying to find the connection as Terry goes back to train at the dojo and is still being beaten. He ends up going for a dinner break as he takes Xander to a pizza place as Max comes with him and offers to take Xander to play Centuries of the Last Cosmos where Max beats him. They end up getting pizza as Xander says that he can't lose when the Joker steal a pizza off him but Xander kicks the shit out of them. The other two people Xander was with the night before come up to him and tell him that he can't leave without an escort as they make him leave. The next day Xander isn't at the dojo as he finds out from Kairi that his guardians didn't want him coming to the classes anymore. That night Cobra One's doing tests on three of his men as we see that Xander is the Cobra Commander. Well no, that would get him sued, instead he's just the master. The three men being tested on transform into human-animal hybrids and as Max is talking to Terry she gets kicked off the line from Bruce. 
As she gets off, someone rings her doorbell as she sees that it's Xander, as he tells her that he needs to come with her now. She says no as he ends up kicking the door down, and just before being taken, she manages to get back on the line to alert them. Batman ends up getting to Max's just as they're flying off, so he tries to chase after them, but Nunchuck Man comes out and fights him, as they end up falling down. Batman's wings get ripped off as Xander and his men manage to lose Batman. You know what? This first part was actually better than I expected. The whole dojo and Xander being the master of Cobra Cult is actually some really cool stuff. It makes sense that the best student in Kyrie's class is the leader of Cobra, so I'm actually interested to see where the second part goes. Goes above big time but below inkling. This part starts with Terry at the Batcave as he has a few broken ribs from his fall, as Bruce ends up paying Kyrie a visit. Bruce tells her that Xander kidnapped someone, as she says that he's in some kind of cult, but she doesn't know which one since he's going to be their leader. Bruce gets a phone number for her as he ends up leaving, where they find out that Xander is actually the leader of Cobra. Terry decides to suit up even though he's injured to go and save Max, but we then see her as she wakes up in a bed where she has two servants of Xander's talk to her about how her master wants to see Max. She fights the two servants that makes a run for it as some human dinosaur hybrid comes up and stops her from escaping, where they take her to Xander. We see him in his full leader getup as he ends up explaining who he is and that he was artificially raised by the cult to be the perfect leader for Cobra. Batman's out at night where he ends up sneaking into Cobra's facility as someone's following him. But as that's going on, Xander explains to Max that his plan is to make dinosaur human hybrids. Xander shows Max the process where three other men get transformed as he then explains that he's going to use a thermal bomb to increase the temperature of the planet for them to survive. Xander leaves to go sort out the bomb as he orders Cobra 1 to splice Max, but Batman overhears Xander and the Doctor talking about Max and how they're going to splice her. Batman walks in to stop Cobra 1 from splicing her, as he tries to escape with her but struggles since his ribs are still broken. When escaping, the whole facility starts to fly as it's a giant ship, but as Max mentions the bomb, the Nunchuck Man and the Goon approach where they take him out. Batman makes Max stay in a cell to make sure that she's safe, as he's going to go stop the bomb and as Xander's about to drop it, Batman comes in to stop him. Xander ends up splicing himself as he now has to fight a dinosaur hybrid of Xander. He gets knocked around for a bit until we see that the figure that we saw earlier ends up being Kyrie. She helps Batman by fighting Xander and as they're fighting the ship starts to blow up so some men escape as well as Max but as Batman's trying to find Max we see that Kyrie's struggling to escape but she sacrifices herself to let Batman and Max escape before the ship completely blows up. The episode ends with Terry, Max and Bruce at her dojo as they say their goodbyes. Damn this episode's even better. Xander's plan is pretty basic to basically wipe out normal humans in favour for dinosaur human hybrids since they're cold blooded like reptiles, but I do like the stuff where Xander was basically born and raised to lead them and ends up actually being a big threat. It's just a surprise that I actually enjoyed episodes featuring the Cobra Cult since I never liked them before, but I think Xander's the most interesting thing about them since he actually has a character. Goes above the first part. Countdown starts at the conference as Mad Stan comes in to blow shit up like usual. Wasn't he in a simulation last time we saw him? Why don't you just keep him there? Probably explained in some comic or something, I don't know. Anywho, he keeps on blowing things up until Batman comes in to stop him, and Mad Stan ends up escaping as Batman has to save some people. We then see Zeta in disguise with Ro, as they're trying to find a scientist named Eli Selig. They really tried to make people watch the Zeta project by making the second last episode of the show be about Zeta again? So of course, since Zeta's back, Agent Bennett's back, as they find Zeta at a train station, so now they have to escape Bennett. As they're making a run for it, one of the agents manages to knock Zeta out, but Mad Stan out if anyone helps him since he hates the government. Mad Stan takes Zeta back to his hideout as he reveals himself to be a robot, and now Zeta's design is the same as the show's? Probably because the show came out the same year as this episode. Mad Stan thinks it's a conspiracy as Ro tries to ring the authorities for Batman, as for some reason Bruce is listening. The worker on the phone tells her that it's illegal to make fake phone calls to the authorities, so she hangs up as a few jokers come up to her. They spray her with some spray paint and she tries to make a run for it but fails, as Batman then comes in to save her as the jokers leave, Ro explains that they both know Zeta and that Zeta got taken by Mad Stan. Speaking about him, he ends up putting a bomb on Zeta as he gives him an address to go to where Ro apparently is. Batman then manages to get into Mad Stan's place as it seems too quiet. He finds out that Mad Stan's fast asleep after taking sleeping pills. His dog comes in with a DVD as Batman puts it in the DVD player to see Mad Stan explaining his plan with Zeta. He explains that he's using him to blow up a place at midnight and that he'll wake up after it all happens. Batman gives Ro a device where she can contact Batman if she finds Zeta, so Batman tries to get Bennett to help find Zeta but he doesn't care if the robot blows up. His accomplice ends up putting a tracker on the Batmobile as Batman leaves, where Bennett's tracking him to potentially find Zeta. Speaking of Zeta, we see him as Joker's trying to take him down where he literally just throws them all around as Batman accidentally catches one of the Jokers. 
He finds out from him that Zeta's headed towards the Department of Health, but Batman gets there one minute before midnight as he quickly gets Zeta and throws the bomb out of the building just before it explodes. Batman explains to Zeta what happened as Bennett and his men surround the building. Zeta tells Batman to leave as he ends up reluctantly doing so, but we find out that it was actually Zeta in the Batmobile disguising himself as Batman. Terry ends up escaping as Bennett's men find a normal guy that isn't Zeta in disguise, which ends up being Terry in disguise. Batman meets up with Zeta as he explains how Bennett put a tracker on the Batmobile as Zeta and Rose say their goodbyes to Batman and go their own ways. This is one of the weirdest episodes in the show because I feel like nothing really happens in the episode. The only real threat in this episode is Mad Stan's plan to use Zeta as a walking time bomb, but besides from that, it was extremely obvious that Bennett wouldn't get Zeta and that they would all escape, but they kind of ended up escaping way too easily. The episode's alright, but I'm hoping that the last episode's better. It goes above Untouchable, but below Big Time. Alright, here we go. Last episode of the show. It starts with Max at school as Terry comes up to her, as we see one of Nash's friends make a joke about how Batman's at the school more than Terry. Terry finds out that Max made the joke before, as Terry gets shitty about it since it could potentially expose his identity as Batman. Max doesn't get the deal with keeping it a massive secret, where he ends up telling the story about how a kid ended up finding out his identity. A kid named Miguel, obviously not that one, as he's playing with two action figures he has. His mother tells him to play with other kids, but he doesn't want to as he then wanders off to a building while playing with his action figures. We then see Cobra breaking into a place as Batman comes in to stop them. They get into a ship as Batman chases them in the Batmobile. They shoot at Batman, but one of the rockets lands at the building that the kid's playing at, where Batman has to go and save them. He ends up going to get him off the roof, where the kid's scared of Batman, so to make the kid not scared after running away from him, he takes his mask off to show that he's just a guy under the mask. When Terry does that, he ends up saving Miguel and taking him to his mother. The story stops for a moment as Max says that it proves her point, but Terry continues on with his story. He says that Cobra wasn't happy about what happened, but they use a device on a goon that was a part of the operation, where they find out that he told a family member about their operation. They throw him into a pit of snakes as they find out that Miguel saw Batman's face as he tells news reporters on the news that he saw his face. So that news spread like wildfire as Bruce got extremely angry at Terry since the boy will be a target to criminals that want to know Batman's identity. As Miguel's walking home, Cobra's goons come in to try and take the kid, but Batman comes in to stop them. After fighting with him, the police come in and take the kid into protective custody. Terry thought that Bruce contacted Barbara about taking the kid into protective custody, but he tells her that he didn't as Batman handed him into Cobra goons in disguise. So Batman ends up finding out the number of the cop car to find two Cobra goons as they ditch the car and then go for the base as Batman follows them. Cobra 1 puts the device on Miguel's head to try and get Batman's identity, but they try to convince him to make him remember what Batman looks like. They end up getting a face, and as they're about to make the kid go into a snake pit, Batman comes in to fight them. He manages to take them all out as Cobra 1 tells Batman that they know what he looks like, and then jumps into the pit as we see the face on the computer doesn't look like Terry at all, but it looks like his action figure. The episode ends with Terry still talking to Max, as he gives Miguel his ball back and mentions that the kid that he just gave the ball to was him, and that he never noticed that he was Batman. Yeah, this episode's still good, even now. This is the best Cobra episode, and they aren't even the focus. It's probably because the whole plot point of Batman's identity being potentially exposed is a really good idea. I like how they don't even get a good visual of what Batman looks like, since the kid was only like 11, and kids' memories with faces that they only saw for like a second wouldn't be very good. Definitely a good episode to end this show off on. Goes above Inkling, but below Out of the Past. Honestly, if you ask me, this season's probably the best out of the three. There was only one episode I wasn't really a fan of at all, and that was King's Ransom. But you also have at least five pretty good episodes, which is honestly very good for a 13 episode season. I noticed that this season wasn't as dark as the past two seasons, but that's not a bad thing. The really good episodes in this season still have serious plots, but can still be silly at times, and I think that works most of the time. I will still never understand why some fans disregard season two and three. Season 3 is my personal favourite, but there are still things I don't like about the season overall, such as having so many episodes with Cobra, and having Big Time Charlie come back after the episode Big Time. We really didn't need those things, and lastly, I don't think we needed the Zeta episode. I like how the episode Zeta ended, and it was a good setup to the show. Well, I finished Batman Beyond. And Batman Beyond is a certified banger. I feel like with this show, it's actually really consistent overall, even more consistent than Batman the Animated Series but I will say that that show has much higher highs than this one does. Sure, there are some episodes in the show that I'm not a fan of, such as Rats, Joyride, and Centuries of the Last Cosmos, but there are also some episodes that I love, such as The Cold Two-Parter, Out of the Past, Eyewitness, and Meltdown. I'm really glad that I went back to watch this show since I loved it when I was younger, and I still love it now. I will say that this show honestly deserves to be as remembered as Batman the Animated Series does. 
I know that BTAS has had more of an influence over superhero animated works and animation in general, but the fact that the creators of this show were able to create a whole new Gotham with a new Batman to face off against new villains so well is a fucking achievement. Especially considering that this was kind of forced onto the BTAS crew since Kids WB wanted a teenage Batman, it's honestly insane how well they did with the show. But it's time to rank every single episode in the show, and we're starting off with Rats, Joyride, Centuries of the Last Cosmos, Where's Terry, The Winning Edge, Armory, Terry's Friend Dates a Robot, Plague, King's Ransom, Blackout, Spellbound, Heroes, A Touch of Kurare, Betrayal, Splices, Zeta, Speak No Evil, April Moon, Untouchable, Countdown, Shriek, Final Cut, Big Time, Payback, The Curse of Cobra Part 1, The Curse of Cobra Part 2, The Egg Baby, Ascension, Once Burned, Revenant, Hidden Agenda, Inkling, The Last Resort, Lost Soul, Bloodsport, Disappearing Ink, Babel, Mind Games, Rebirth Part 2, Golem, Dead Man's Hand, Unmasked, Earth Mover, Hooked Up, Ace in the Hole, Rebirth Part 1, Sneak Peek, Eyewitness, Out of the Past, The Call Part 1, The Call Part 2, and lastly, the best episode of Batman Beyond is Meltdown. I am so glad that this show started off really strong with the Rebirth 2-parter, just telling the story and how Bruce retired and how Terry became Batman 20 years later. Even after that, Blackout's a solid episode. I really liked Golem, and then you get to my favourite episode of the show being Meltdown. We didn't need Mr. Freeze in this show, but you know what? It ended up being the best episode, so I'm definitely happy to see Mr. Freeze back since most episodes with him are usually slam dunks. Then from season 1, it's just up and down, and I noticed that it's kind of a pattern throughout the rest of the show. You will have like one or two really good episodes, and then you'll have one week episode. Not every episode in this show is going to be amazing. That's okay. Some ideas just work better than others. But I am still impressed even now with how good the show is. Half the time when scripting this video, I just wanted to sit there and watch the episodes instead of writing notes. They are that good. I just wish that we had more Batman Beyond content, but unfortunately, that's just the world we live in. Anyways, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a like. Please make sure to subscribe if you enjoy this kind of content. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments about Batman Beyond. Any kind of support would be much appreciated because these videos take a very long time to make, especially whilst I'm making content on the side as well. It's really hard to get enough time to make these massive videos. So if you do really want to support me, please consider supporting my Patreon and my channel memberships. Helps me out heaps. Speaking about that though, let's just get into the shoutouts. Alright, massive shoutout to Ash Crimson for supporting my channel license tier. Massive thanks to Fatima, Victoria Huntley, and SamM1994 for supporting my Big Boss tier. If you want to find out how you can get your name at the end of my videos, please make sure to click the little Patreon logo on the screen at the moment, or click the little join button next to the subscribe button on my YouTube channel. Anyways, I'll see you on the next one.